stand for Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I didn't smack that gavel because I almost broke it last week. <laughs> the first one. Roll call um, shows everyone's here except for Joe. I make a motion to excuse Joe. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So with the approval of the minutes of November 23rd, 2015, do you have anybody that has anything to amend? I do. Uh, page six. Uh, at the end of that first first section, it says insular issues. It should be ancillary issues. On page seven, I'd like the addition at the conclusion of that whole body of text on at the top of the page. Kibble agreed to changes. The changes should be made, but regrets they weren't conveyed to the city manager in private before the meeting. And on page. Ten. Um, just below or just above halfway down um, the first word in the, the sentence is problem uh, it's like one two three four five lines up from the uh, manager's report uh, I'd like to add after well it should be problem was period um, or the existing Excuse me. Fortunately for for Lisa, I've given her a copy of the change. Uh, it says uh, the problem was the existing agreement. Oh, for heaven's sakes, I should have read this prior to it. A, a new agreement would have fixed a sunset. That's what it was. Um, Carmen was talking about the um, a new DDA, changing the, the terms of the DDA, and it, it historically had been that we have a perpetual DDA, and if we changed it, then we would have a sunset. And she's got the language, and essentially that's the synopsis of what it, it says. I'm having trouble figuring out how I piecemealed that together. Um, that's all I had, thanks. Maggie? Yes, I would like to add on page seven at the top. Um, this is, uh, it says, Councilman Reese, you say we need to have an effective and correct contract to ensure the city is covered. Please add, Kurtzweil additionally stated that the matter regarding lease terms were discussed on public record because it was a public matter. On page nine, I'd like to, it's uh, maybe about the fourth line down, fifth or sixth line down. It's Brantford, Maines. Correct spelling the name is M A Y N E S. And on page 11, in the uh, first, second, third, in the fourth paragraph, the gentleman's name from South Lion Square is Brian Najor. It's N-A-J-O-R. And that's it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Anyone else? Move the minutes as amended. Second. Second. Okay. Aye. 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 Okay, hey, we have uh, a little packet of bills here to go through. Anyone have anything? Maggie? I have three questions. Uh, the first one, please, is um, it's a miscellaneous item. Uh, Rachel Baker, it's an overpayment, 2,281. Explanation, please. 
That was a second payment of taxes we received. Sometimes we get those from mortgage companies after they've already been paid by either the title company or the homeowner. So then we have to give them back to whoever they, whoever paid last is who they, the tax money goes back to. Okay. Uh, the, thank you very much. The next question is item, um, well, it has vendor item 0364. It's Douglas Bakke, tuition reimbursement. Yes, by uh, the collective bargaining agreement, the city pays a portion of officers' tuition for higher education. It's limited to $1,200 per year, and that's a payment for his most recent semester. And, and what is he getting a degree in? You know? It, it's, he's taking criminal justice classes. I'm not positive what the exact degree will be. Okay. I'd like to congratulate him on taking advantage of the city's tuition reimbursement program. I'll make exactly. a point of doing that. Yeah. I think the city benefits when the employees um, uh, take advantage and, and upgrade their education level. So please tell him I say thank you for taking the time and the effort doing that. The next question um, is uh, vendor 3100, State of Michigan, sex offender registration fee, $30. What's that all about? <clears throat> the sex offenders are required to periodically re-register at their local police department, and the police department collects the fee from the sex offender. Uh, I believe we collect $50, but whatever we collect is more than the 30. The 30 is the portion of the re registration fee that is due to the state. The city then gets to keep the balance of whatever the amount is, and I believe it's 50. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Is there anyone else? I move the bills. I'll support. All favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> okay, approval of the agenda for tonight's meeting. We actually have two changes under old business. Um, after the packets went out, um, we received additional feedback from the other two members of the SLERA jurisdictions. Um, they have some questions on the new language of the SLERA lease agreement. Um, as a result, we're going to take that item off the agenda and um, continue negotiations with those two jurisdictions and bring that back once those that language is amenable to all three jurisdictions. The second item is under new business, item number four, the revised IT Clemis agreement. Um, Chief Collins and I met this morning, and after discussions between myself, him, and the city attorney. Um, there's several things that were fluid in this agreement, as well as the fact that um, the city is looking at potentially using Oakland County as its web payment service for um, online bill payment, since we're not particularly happy with the contract for the service provider we had been looking at and we're meeting with them tomorrow, so we're going to take that item off the agenda pending further negotiations. Is there any clock on when it needs to be approved? We're slightly ahead of uh, the curve as far as the other communities go, so we're not under time pressure to get it completed. Thanks. <laughs> well, I'll move the uh, agenda as amended then. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, we come to the point, uh, public comment tonight. If anybody has anything to speak that isn't on the agenda, come up to the microphone and uh, state your name and address for the record. Linda Ross, 373 Harvard Avenue. I'm the president of the uh, so South Line Area Historical Society. Larry Ledbetter, 11343 Clovis Point. I'm the president of the Historical, Co Historical Commission. We're here tonight to introduce ourselves and uh, tell you who we are and tell you what we do. <clears throat> it is, as the host historical commission, it's a responsibility to maintain the buildings and the grounds of the village with, with the much appreciated support of the DPW and the volunteers of both the commission and the society. 
As the president of the Historical Society, it is our responsibility to oversee donations that come in, catalog them, store and preserve them for future generations. We provide docents from the 1st of April to the end of October to greet visitors at the village, to show them around, and to share the history of, the, of those buildings. We also conduct special tours for groups. We open the one-room school to local schools for classes. We keep the inside of the buildings clean and dusted. We change displays, keep an updated calendar of events and groups that use the freight house. We put out a quarterly newsletter. We update the membership list and keep track of dues. We present programs and events through the year. And for the last five years, we have provided a gardening group to keep the gardens weeded and the bushes trimmed, saving the city a considerable amount of money. All of these positions are done by people who volunteer their time and energy, uh, except for the uh, position of the uh, paid position of the custodian. Uh, it's done because of the dedication and commitment by the members of both groups to ensure that the history of South Lyon is preserved for our future generations. We would like to invite anyone who has not had the, had the privilege to visit the village to learn its history by, by contacting us for a tour. Uh, the Society Info is on the city website, and the phone number is 248-437-9929. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask questions? Yeah, yeah actually, the... Um, the tower, the bell tower in the chapel, I yes. see that's being worked on. Do you have a Yes, we've, we've had some difficulty getting a contractor. We had one that started the pro project, and we had a, a very good price on it, but he was unable to, able to complete the project. It was more than he was able to do. We're looking at some options right now, and I, I need to get with Mr. Martin and see if he can uh, help us with that project because it, we're in a bad place right now with the weather coming we're good right now, but it's going to get really bad, and so it's a difficult project. We have to be, the big part that I have to deal with is the concern about somebody taking on a project that they can't handle, getting up that high off the ground could be quite difficult. So I saw those tarps. I called Bob right away wondering, yeah. our guys didn't go up there. No, no. <laughs> so, no, I'm going to okay. confer with Mr. Martin, see if he can help us resolve this. We, we have... We have tried three or four different contractors to try and get it done, but uh, uh, we've got a couple of more options to go. But we want to get it that taken care of before it deteriorates. Yeah, sure. Thank you. That building was built in 1930, so, and it was a Sears uh, yeah. uh, mail order church. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, it was intended to be relatively portable, wasn't it? It's like yes, it's yes. Analyzed. Uh, yeah. We pictured it as being delivered on a on a train on a flatbed, and then picked up with a buckboard, and then brought to the site where it was erected. It? And it served the community here in South Lyon over at the Lutheran Church for about sixty years. <laughs> yeah. so. Well, thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Carl Richards, 390 Lennox. Uh, <clears throat> just want to share a few thoughts with you. I'm going to keep it under five minutes, okay? Uh, if anybody noticed, I'm riding a new bicycle. Or it's not new, but it's a different bicycle, okay? And uh, same baskets and seat, but it's a different one. The old one gave out. I was spinning my wheels too much and uh, couldn't get across an intersection right. <laughs> anyway, I wanted to give you some good news and some... Some of it you may be a little puzzled by, okay. First up, I uh, thought I'd let you know that the boats across the street from my house are all gone as of 4 o'clock today. Those were primarily pontoon boats on trailers and such. And uh, uh, maybe they hauled them out back. I don't know. Maybe they're not off the premises, but uh, I would have looked at that. I just thought they got plenty of room out back. That nobody will see them. But anyway, they're all gone where they were uh, as of 4 o'clock this afternoon. There was five of them there this morning. Uh, next project. Okay, next item. I uh, just thought I'd let you know the Big B Coffee project is, seems to be almost completed, com completely done down there. It's been quite a haul for those people. And uh, I never go. I'm not a customer. I don't patronize the place. But I know they've, they've been here quite a while, and they've put a good effort in and... and uh, 
they seem to be sincere. So I just thought I'd let you know that in case nobody else ever talks about it. Um, <coughs> this little item here, as you probably can imagine, I've frequented the site of 390 Lafayette many times. And I have talked with the people a little bit, and I uh, took pictures. Took a picture today, first time you could go right through the front window all the way to the back. That uh, inside wall, last inside wall was taken out. Uh, I, I got a copy of the contract uh, last week, and uh, as I understand, all of you had a, had a chance to view this contract and everything. And before, you, before it was signed, I just want to bring something to your attention. First, I'll just let you know. Uh, yeah, I used to, once upon a time, close to 40 years ago, I used to write contracts for a living. Not in this type of thing, though. Uh, it was a line of work I stumbled into and did for two or three years. Anyway, the major thing in a contract situation is fulfilling the mutual intent of both parties involved. And... Uh, in the course of the contract, as I read it, uh, there's not one word in that contract about removing the concrete floor of the old bowling alley. Everything else, yes. And I, uh, I asked the guys, I, Mr. Richard Hoffman, I believe it is. Uh, he's the on-site manager. I asked him, what's uh, going to happen with the concrete here I'm standing on? He said, we're not taking it out. And I said, do you have plans for covering it? And he said, maybe. Well, technically, under the contract as I read it, uh, once they get everything down to the bare bones, they can cover it over with a load of topsoil and put some sod and some grass and some plantings on there, and they've fulfilled the contract. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I don't know if that's exactly what we'd hoped for, but uh, technically, the way it reads, uh, that's entirely possible, letting you know. Move on, okay. Uh, as you can probably imagine, I've been up to the Knolls many times. Some, st okay, be fair to all parties involved. Some stuff is great up there. He's really done a great job on a few things. There's no doubt about it, okay. Uh, some stuff, moving on along, 50-50. You'll have to wait and see whatever happens. It's a combination of Mother Nature and and the forces of physics and vectors of weight and, and uh, water. Uh, and there's a few other things moving on down that uh, not quite so good and borderlining on a bad. But I don't care to go into the details at this time. But let's put it, I'll just render one small opinion. Wow, if he, if he doesn't put 21 AA under sidewalks, driveways, and patios, I'll be amazed if they don't just start sliding. Just like that. In that soil. Which I maintain has never been properly tested. Okay. Item number five. Planning Commission. Uh, I just talked with the chairman. Um, uh, not tonight, but after the first of the year, uh, I'm going to have some serious thoughts about the Planning Commission and some proposals for the Council. And I've mentioned some of it to the Chairman, and I'm not going to go into details tonight, but uh, uh, I think the Planning Commission needs uh, some Council attention. and. Uh, I think many of us are in agreement on that point. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. <coughs> okay. So we don't have any old business that's been uh, removed. Lease agreement with Slara. So we have new business. Number one on the list is public hearing of the CDBG program year 2016. Um, could you explain what that is to everybody 
Certainly. The CDBG program is the Community Development Block Grant Program, which is a federal government program uh, for which we are a pass-through community from Oakland County. We get a estimated allotment of which this year is 35,261. We won't know the final allotment until Oakland County gets their final allotment from the federal government after the first of the year. Um, they give us a planning allot allotment, which is the 35,261. Um, we then look at projects in the community that are considered eligible projects. Um, we discussed those projects at the last meeting, um, discussed that being the Senior Center, which has been a project that has been supported by the community for several years, as well as the Public Service Domestic and Abuse Shelter Program Haven. Um, again, it was brought up that next year we look at additional services for a different programs here within South Lyon for some of the funding. Um, in order to do this, the applications require us to fill out and complete an application, hold, it, hold and notice a public hearing, um, do an affidavit of the public hearing, submit what, app, what programs we are going to support, submit the application to the county, um, once all of that is done and the application is completed, they either approve or deny the programs that we're supporting. Um, and then we move forward as the programs go forward. Um, one thing you will notice not in this year's packet is a subrecipient agreement. That is something that is normally done. Um, that agreement is something that is being revamped for 2016, so we don't have those this year. Um, it is something that we're also cleaning up from back years because there are subrecipient agreements that are missing from previous year's CDBG applications that need to be cleaned up, as well as sub submissions for CDBG reimbursements. Um, so we are going through and getting a lot of that cleaned up. This year we are applying for two projects. The first, which the county has said there's a minimum project allocation of 3,000. The first project is a um, $30,261 project allocation for the Senior Center, which is part of our um, annual allocation to the Senior Center is a joint uh, Center for Active Adults um, with Green Oak Township and Lyon Township. It is located in the South Lyon High School on Pontiac Trail. The second project, as I mentioned, is a public service shelter for domestic and abused and um, substance abuse shelter. It is an allocation of 5,000, which is the remaining of our allocation. That is our usual annual allocation for the city. This would allow us not to take general fund monies to give to Haven um, and do just the general $5,000 allocation of CDBG funds rather than using any of our general fund money since there is the minimum $3,000 allocation requirement. Thanks, Len. I just, uh, I probably should have opened the public meeting and public hearing up first. But I wanted well, to have an explanation of kind of what, because we always talk in acronyms all the time. A right. Lot. I think people ask me what those mean. So I think it would be good just to explain kind of when we start to do that as we get started so people understand what we're going to discuss. A little further, but that's good. So I'd like to open. Can form up the line for people. To yeah. <laughs> open the public hearing, the CDBG program for the year 2016. Does anybody have comment? Anybody up there? Close the public hearing. Just close it. Close the public hearing. Okay, so I guess we will close the public hearing of the CDBG program 2016. Well, given all that participation, um, <laughs> I'd, I'd make the motion that we uh, we approve the planned use for the CD. CDBG funds and approve the CDBG application. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Yes. Uh, there is one more thing. Um, 
as we're doing our public hearing this evening and the applications are due this Friday, there is in your packet included with this, it is a resolution that um, we can submit because we won't have approved the minutes of the public hearing for the CDBG hearing. Um, it should be uh, about halfway through your CDBG application packet. It'll state resolution of the City Council of the City of South Lyon at the top. There's a typo. It should be 15 and say 16. Ah, really, yeah. Thank you. But if the council would be willing to authorize and pass such resolution, that would uh, make the final step in the application that much easier rather than having to submit draft minutes of the, of the minutes for this evening's meeting. Mr. Mayor, I have a quick comment. Um, just kind of to clarify, I'm looking at this and I know the project, the senior project, I understand that where the money's going to, but it says PS battered and abused spouses. I was under the impression that we were going to do a different program. So is this going to be, are we going to cross this out and update it with the South Lion program or is this going to stay for now? No, and we said later? for this year we were going to stay with Haven. We will investigate new programs for program year 17. Oh, okay. So not for 2016. Right. Correct. Because there was not enough time to investigate programs in South Lion oh, okay. to, to get them put together and do the public hearing notice for, because of the time requirement of 10 day notice okay. for this meeting. Thank you for clarifying. Yes. We also spoke of there, there may be alternative funding sources for some of those mm -hmm. other projects. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'll move the resolution then. I'll support. Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Okay. Discussion with the council tonight on the uh, blight, unsafe structures, and problematic property owners with attorney Paul Burns, an associate. Um, this dated from the last meeting we had. We had a lengthy discussion about blight and ordinances, and Councilman uh, Megan Kurtzwell brought up um, some information that I thought would be very useful to the council, and they're here tonight to discuss with us. And Great, thank you. Um, can you? Uh, if we put a PowerPoint up, can you see it back there? Do you, does it go on the screens down here? You don't want anybody going to sleep when you turn the lights out, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, good evening. Uh, my name is Paul Burns, and uh, this is Brad Maines, who's uh, been working with me for the last 10 years or so. Um, basically, Ms. Kurzweil stopped by our office and asked, uh, one day just stopped in and asked us to uh, provide some information about how we've dealt with blight in the city of Brighton. Um, so we sat and had a cup of coffee with her and then it led to us being invited here. So we're happy to be here and uh, just to give you some introduction of ourselves, uh, I've, I've been the city attorney in Brighton uh, since 1980, so seen a lot of changes. So 35 years as city attorney, which is very much like this community, quite frankly, in terms of growth around it and the city in the middle of a number of townships and so on and so forth. Brad's been with me for 10 years, and there's, a, there's another uh, woman attorney by the name of Heather who uh, also has a, a number of years' experience. And so, so this is just to introduce ourselves. This is our office in downtown Brighton. So we have kind of a historical building downtown, um, built it in order to uh, preserve the historical context of town and be part of town and be part of the future of town. And so keep going, Brad. So again, we're based in downtown Brighton. 
Uh, there's th three attorneys. We are the city attorneys for Brighton. We represent Northfield Township. Uh, we're also the county attorneys for the Livingston County Road Commission. And on the other side, in communities where we don't have a conflict of interest, we've done a number of uh, development projects. Uh, I've been the attorney for the Hidden Lake Project, if you know what that one is. I tried that case. Mill River down the street. I did that one with uh, Dominic Mosheri before it went bust. <laughs> but in any event, so we've got a lot of experience. And so let me just explain to you kind of what we did in the city of Brighton. So if you go ahead, Brad. So what we decided to do, um, you know, as any city, it goes through a lot of, you know, ups and downs and so on with the economy. What we decided to do was we created a group that we called Blightbusters. I mean, it was facetious, but what we did is we took the key people on the city staff, we took the planner, the city engineer, zoning enforcement, code enforcement people, and we got together. And what we did was we made a list of all the problem properties in town. We just made a, just first thing we did was just made a list of all the problem properties in town. And then internally as staff, what we did was we ranked them from the worst to the, to the least problem, if you will. We kind of, Brad has up here, we triage them. But uh, the, the theory was is that the, the properties that uh, created a health, safety, welfare problem uh, were the ones that we started with first. So if they created a danger to the community, we thought that we needed to deal with that immediately. There are also properties in town that were really uh, blocking, if you will, they were an impediment to the development of town because they were so uh, blight ridden, if you will, that they were curbing investment in the downtown area because people didn't want to spend money next to a building that was terrible. We also uh, ranked them as they related to the public projects that we had. Uh, whether it was a sidewalk project or a parking lot project or any of those kinds of projects. And so we created a list <coughs> so that we could work our way through town and solve the biggest problems and work to the smallest problems. Uh, we had some long time, uh, you know, long time property only problems um, that also needed to be addressed. So go ahead, Brian. Um, so after we made that list and we decided, let's call it the top five or the top ten, uh, we took a look at the tools that we had and the ordinances on the books or the ordinances that we should get on the books to um, bring town into compliance and bring the properties into compliance. So, you know, the, the, generally the city uh, tries to be respectful of the property owners in town. So. There's always communication made with the property owners to try to get voluntary compliance. Um, some of the property owners, um, you really couldn't tell what the blight problems were because they wouldn't let you in the property. And so uh, we came up with, there's a statute that allows for what we call an administrative search warrant. And it's not a search warrant in a classic sense of a, uh, a criminal search warrant, but you can get it out of the district court pretty easily. Then we would take all of our inspectors, we get into the building through a search warrant, and then, um, which is a civil search warrant, and we'd bring in the plumbing inspector, the electrical inspector, the building inspector, the zoning inspector, and we'd go through the building and inventory everything that was wrong with the building and from a safety standpoint or a code violation standpoint. After that, we'd kind of reconnoiter the, the group and we'd come back and see what we had as it related to our ordinances and what was on the book or books or what should be on the books. So, so and I'm going to turn some of this over to Brad, but basically, um, if it was a smaller problem, we would try to issue district court tickets. If it was a larger problem or a long time uh, problem, we knew we were going to head off to court, so we would get this administrative search warrant so we knew exactly what we had. And we had photographs, we had all the evidence together. And then we would take a look. These are the four uh, most uh, utilized tools that we would use. Um, and quite frankly, 
if they were problem properties, we'd throw the book at them. We'd hit them with everything. Um, these would all be separate counts in a lawsuit, have been counts in a lawsuit, that can be used for different uh, types of issues with regard to the property. And I'll, I'll have Brad talk to you about these four different types. So as a practical matter, um, good evening, first of all. <laughs> um, as a practical matter, what you're doing in a code enforcement context is going to be limited um, by what tools you have available to you. Um, and each four of these tools are all things that we had available in Brighton, and they all have slightly different uses. Um, the Michigan Building Code, for instance, works very well if you have an ongoing piece of construction. You have somebody who started doing construction and for whatever reason has just sort of slacked off somewhere short of being done. Well, the Michigan Building Code still applies there, and so that's a good fit. However, if you have a property that's been constructed for some time and is having maintenance issues, the building code's less of a good fit. Then you want something more like the property maintenance code, which is really designed to get at those issues where you have maintenance that's lapsed. Um, and if it's lapsed severely, you end up in a situation where you're using something like an unsafe structures ordinance or a dangerous buildings ordinance. Um, and that's what we litigated extensively in the city successfully. Um, finally is the common law nuisance, which sort of overlays all three of these categories. And before we had statutes for absolutely everything, common law nuisance was what there was. That was a little bit before my time. It wasn't before Paul's. Um, so, <laughs> um, so as a, as a practical matter, uh, we would inventory, figure out what the most uh, appropriate code was to go under. Um, we've done just a brief review of what you have here in South Lyon. Obviously, you've opted into enforcing the Michigan Building Code by ordinance, so you have that available to you. Uh, the property maintenance code you have, it's a little old. Um, the way that these codes that you adopt by reference work is you adopt a specific code, so usually you adopt the code that's in place when you adopt it. Um, as a practical matter, that was about 20 years ago now. It's a 1996 property maintenance code, so probably you would want to update that. Um, and you don't have an unsafe structures or dangerous buildings ordinance, um, so probably you would want to have that as well to deal with sort of these structures that have been around for a long time, but the property maintenance code is really... Um, as Paul would say, is sort of hitting it with a scalpel instead of with a sledgehammer. You know, really the property maintenance code is intended for people who have sort of performed, you know, have performed in good faith in the past, but just aren't there right now. Whereas the unsafe structures ordinance is more when you have someone who's really recalcitrant. As a practical matter, the unsafe structures ordinance in the city of Brighton is, uh, we call it Supreme Court approved. Uh, we litigated it all the way up through the Court of Appeals to the Supreme Court. And sort of the core of that uh, ordinance is the first bullet point here on the screen, where if you have a structure that's unsafe and the cost of repairs exceed the value of the structure, in other words, you're essentially paying for the structure all over again to repair it, then there's a presumption that that structure is a public nuisance and you can demolish it without, or you can order it to be demolished without an opportunity to repair. The reason why this is important is when you get to that level of infraction, you get to that level of repairs that are necessary, you can spend so much time on what the necessary fixes are when really the necessary fix is just to move on. Um, and yes, sir. You know what? I'm going to have to ask questions during the course of yeah, this. Yeah, please. What if you have a historical, a horse, historically noteworthy building that the last thing you want to see happen is the building come down? You want to preserve it at all costs, if possible. I mean, does this preclude you from being able to do that? All right, you're in. Uh, I can, yeah. You're in um, classic lawyerville here. If you look at the third to last line of the first bullet point, almost at the end, such structure is a public nuisance which may be ordered demolished without option. All right. As a result, the position that we yeah, took in yeah. the city of Brighton was the option of council as to how they want to proceed. And really that sort of flexibility, like I said, with the four different class of ordinances is exactly what you're looking for in a code enforcement context. Because to your point, every problem is going to be different. You know, in some cases it's a historic house, in some cases 
it's just a house that's been there a long time. Mm -hmm. um, so the Supreme Court ruled that the asserted private right of repair has to yield to the city's higher governmental in interest in protecting the health, safety, and welfare of its citizens. Um, and that's what we've been arguing for consistently is this isn't so much about knocking down houses or making people do work that they don't want to do. It's about protecting the health, safety, and welfare of the citizens. Who makes the determination um, that the building is unsafe? Would it be the building inspector? Would it be the fire department? Who makes that initial determination that the building's unsafe? Uh, it depends. It's going to be, to answer your question briefly, it's going to be whose code is whose jurisdiction. So if it's a problem under the fire code that's causing it to be unsafe, then it would probably be the fire department's call. If it's something under the building code or under the unsafe structures ordinance, that's much more likely to be a building department issue. But it, as I say, it's going to depend on the peculiarities of the ordinance. Seems like at that level it might end up being multiple people it, that it are... That have, it was all of the codes. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, so some of the worst house... This, this ordinance that we're throwing up here that was, uh, is really your worst case scenario. What we've always tried to do is work with everybody. You just want to work with everybody. You want to preserve the whole historical context. C City Council doesn't want to have a reputation for being heavy-handed. The staff doesn't want to have a reputation for being heavy-handed. So you just work it through at notches in a reasonable, logical fashion, polite, civilized, and you, you try to get compliance is what you're trying to do. Even if it doesn't make sense to fix up an old building, we want people to fix them up. Um, but if it's fallen on the next door neighbor's property, something's got to happen. Uh, some of these buildings that we were, they were actually falling. And uh, so that's kind of a, uh, you really go at this in a very metered way. Yeah, so that you make good judgments and the council makes good judgments and you're just doing it methodically through town. That's why you're not just picking out one property. You're trying to, to triage the whole town at once. So sometimes you just have grass that's grown or junk in the yard or old cars or you get those out of there too. But you don't you use all the different tools for different levels of problems. Now we even, at one point in time, uh, if you're familiar with Brighton, right behind uh, Stouts, there's a parking lot there. So we worked at, this. there's two kinds of condemnation. This, this unsafe structures ordinance is co condemnation because it's not safe, but the property owner ends up with the property. There's eminent domain where the city takes the property. So we, we did a deal with the uh, downtown, the, the, uh, the DDA, and we condemned an old house and we turned it into a parking lot. So we took it for a public purpose, but it was a shack. And so when you go to Stouts and you park behind Stouts, that was an old, dilapidated house, not a historical house. So historical. you had to pay the market value? We did. We did. Um, but town has more That's parking. That's a really slippery slope in my eyes. But I, it, it can be. It, you, you do it cautiously, but it is another option. So you kind of look at them all and see what makes sense for each property. It's not a one-size-fits-all uh, kind of proposition. So Councilman Kramer's question about how it, it's, how, we, how he makes that decision, it's all predicated on what you said in the beginning where you, we have a group of inspectors and everybody all put together with our ordinances in line and then they go in and make their reports and then that's all right. at one time to take. So it, it could be all of it and it could be. It, it's hard to hit, hit it all at once. You know, it depends on how much you have, but you, you definitely hit the, the ones that are unsafe first. Um, and then you work your way down through the list, and then pretty soon, well, like in town, we have pretty much all of it done. Uh, there, we really have very minor problems at this point in time. And, and the fact that you are bringing people into compliance makes people come into compliance on their own because they know it's coming. Mm -hmm. And the goal is to just get people to take care of their own property, not for government to be... Uh, babysitting everybody through town, just fix up town because it's bad for your neighbor, it's bad for the downtown, it's bad for property values, it's bad for the synergy of your downtown because, you know, the whole point is to, you know, get your town rolling on an uptick, if you will. 
when you hit the recalcitrance first, though, it, it kind of urges the lesser players to comply. So, you know. Right. And then that's all of a sudden, it's kind of weird. At this point in time, we have no cases, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Right. So they kind of all. But, go. I mean, you did have a host of things that at one point, you have to start someplace. So, you know doesn't happen in one fell You know, the, the conversation our council had is, of course, one of the primary functions of government is to clean up your town. And, you know, it's kind of painful because uh, people don't like the nasty letter. They don't like the lawyer letter. They don't like the court action. They don't like the ticket. You guys get the phone call. You know? Along those same lines, did you get a lot of pushback then from store owners, people who own the property? I uh, know the, the people who overall who are investing in town are glad to see it because it helps appreciate their properties. And you reach a, you know, having done this for so long, Brighton had a lot of, you know, see-through buildings or empty buildings as we called it, so vacancies and there's some kind of psychological thing that happens in town where everybody's so proud of everything that they actually start policing themselves and they come to us and say straighten this guy out you know those kinds well, of things to be quite frank I mean I'm expecting the worst and hoping for the best so I'm not expecting immediate compliance if we were to approach store owners and say hey listen we need you to clean up X Y and Z so that's what my initial concern would be would be the pushback no compliance Things of that nature. Well, and that's what I'm saying. You you ramp it up professionally, metered, slowly, okay. kindly. You know, you're really only trying to do a good thing for town. It's not it's not a heavy handed thing. It's kind of an interesting thing because the sense is it's the person who's getting it is is thinking that it's heavy handed. So as the city attorneys, we purposely try to take that kind of issue out of it. It's mm -hmm. just we're just just business we're just straight you're just bringing into compliance with the ordinance like everybody else okay. i'm not picking on you you know because everybody thinks they get picked on well but it's perceived that way because they're hypersensitive to the circumstances so well anything and, is it, you can't make it innocuous enough to not offend them but i get you. well that's that's why we started off saying we did this as a group you take all your professionals in your community and you create this list so it's not a code official picking somebody out. It's not an attorney picking somebody out. It is all of your professionals who get in a room. They know what your master plan's all about. They know what your vision of town is about. They know, you know, where town's going and then they create a list so it's handled, um, you know, in a organized, logical fashion, not a selective fashion, if that makes sense. Excluding um, the litigation. What kind of time frame would you say was involved in this? I mean, for revamping the ordinances to getting this group together to identifying the buildings and structures and to start with the friendly approach. I mean, what I would say frame? most of the stuff, with, with the exception of the big litigation, um, 18 months kind of thing. Uh, you have uh, most of the tools in your toolkit already. You don't have the ordinance that we took to the Supreme Court, but that's really for your worst problems. The other ones are for your ordinary problems. Um, it's, so for most of it, it's just getting after it and, and, and making it a priority. And then you end up with a team. Uh, I like Brad does this. We have Jim Rowell, who's the Oakland County, or excuse me, the uh, Livingston County Building Inspector, who's under contract with the city. So they do 25 of these, and they're just in the same rhythm. It's not like they're creating a wheel every time. So they just knock them off like popcorn. And then everybody knows the big ones, you know. And uh, so most of the other ones get knocked out. Okay, the litigation involved a specific uh, section, right? Was it more on, or did it involve, like, I'm looking under Article 3, the unsafe structures. Did it involve all those sections or just uh, specific ones? I'll, I'll let Brad answer that one. <laughs> section 1859 was the primary section that was uh, that was litigated, which is that's a snippet of it up there on the on the screen. Okay. Um, that was the piece that went all the way up to the Supreme Court. They objected to various other portions of the of the ordinance, but none of those got even any traction in the trial court. We we won on all those. What about the right of entry one? 
the right of entry, we didn't litigate. Um, and the reason why we didn't litigate that is to Paul's point earlier, as a practical matter in the state of Michigan, regardless of what your or ordinances say, if you have somebody who's not letting you into the property, you got to get yourself an administrative search okay. warrant. No amount of ordinancing will get you past that requirement. Um, it's actually a federal Supreme Court case. Um, so we didn't litigate that because we went in front of Judge Geddes at Livingston County District Court. We got an administrative search warrant. And that's a, as Paul says, that's, that's a package. We had set, here's the six people we want to go. They're all lined up to go on this date. Everybody has their calendars clear and we just all go. So the probable cause for the warrant simply because it looks like this will be inside? That's a really good question. So there's a couple different ways that you can get the probable cause. Every once in a while, you'll get somebody who will get into the structure for some other reason, and they can report to the building official and say, here's what I saw. And then the building official or the fire official can draw conclusions from that. What we did, what we've had success with um, in, a, in a bunch of different cases is a lot of times you can look at external problems and you can predict internal problems as a result. Probably not enough to prove them in court, but certainly enough to get you probable cause. Mm -hmm. If you've got a hole in a roof, that's not just a hole in a roof. That's water coming in, which is potential mold issues, which is potential electrical issues with shorting, all kinds of things that you can't see from outside the house. But if you're creative about it and you have a smart, good code official who can tie those things together for you, you can get yourself a pretty good argument for an administrative search warrant. I think it makes, it's logical. I just didn't know if that would get traction in court, you know. In our experience, it has. Good. It's easy because all the judge is doing is allow you to take, take pictures. You know, do, once you get in, you're going in with your electrical inspector, and he just looks and takes a picture and goes out the door, you know. Sure. So we're really, it's really non-intrusive. They just have to unlock the door and let us see what's going on inside. A lot of times the plumbing's a mess, the wiring's a mess, especially when you have buildings with common walls. You don't want them burning down the rest of the block, sure. you know. Um, well, your first, your first version of that, though, you said it was comprehensive. You pretty much had every facet of inspection was going to converge on this the, place simultaneously. Yeah, the so. reason we do that, because we only know we get one bite of the apple. Oh, no, it makes sense. And, but, I mean, that was a lot lighter weight that you just suggested yeah, right. there. So we, uh, we, we get everyone in to get a look. And then, you know, if there's not a plumbing problem, our, our plumbing experts dismissed. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. So I don't, what else do you have here, Brian? Interesting enough in the case, ultimately the judge just came down on the fact that this uh, property was a nuisance. You know, so some of this, when you plead a multi-count complaint, the judge can pick under what basis they want to uh, order. Um, and oftentimes the court will allow a time for repair before demolition. So they kind of hang hang you with your own inaction before you get. So I'm going to give you a chance. Well, um, as a property rights guy, I think that that's appropriate. If they if they step up and take care of it, then you shouldn't be squawking about it. So you know nobody had any problem with that. Yeah, but right. Some people just have no intention of really fixing anything. Right. Was there a challenge to the 60 day period for the reasonableness for the repairs? I mean, for that time period, or was it? Because I think when I read that, it was 60 days for them to at least start repairs, and then right before the end of the 60 days, they filed suit. I, in this, this instance, there was, I don't think there was. I can't re recall a challenge. They just sued the city. Yeah. They, they didn't wait for us to sue. They sued the city <laughs> is what happened. So we were off to the races. But if they're making a, le a legitimate effort, you're not going to be pursuing the 60-day thing anyway. So. Well, I'm just the time frame. I right, no. 60 days deemed. The, you, you have to agree on the code because what happens, especially if you have a residential dwelling and it's in a commercial zone, it maybe has lost its nonconforming use. And so, and the property's actually been upzoned from residential to commercial. So, but uh, all of a sudden you got barrier free, you got a different fire standard, things cost more to fix than fixing if it was a house, but the property is also worth more because now it's zoned commercial. So you have those kinds of issues. At least they get to make the decision whether it's worth their effort or not. So Right, yeah, right. right. But uh, we got more here? Just, just. So also just uh, briefly to uh, respond to Councilmember Kramer's question as well. Um, the 60 days, it, it's a it's a sort of 
case specific type thing. Um, what might be reasonable in 60 days might not be reasonable in six months in another case. But in this case, Paul's correct. It was, was not challenged. So to talk about the measured approach that Paul talked about, and he's absolutely right. Um, in my experience dealing with this stuff on the ground with, uh, with Mr. Rowell, I would say um, upwards of 75% of the issues that we had, um, we figured out who the correct person was for the owner, make sure we're talking to the right person for the property. Code enforcement officer goes out and says, hey, you know, we've had some complaints. I just want to check it out and see if it's right. They let him in. He checks it out. It's not right. He says it needs to be fixed. 30, 45 days later, you know, pull a permit. Things start to move along and, you know, three, four months, you're finished up. Um, and, and that's the goal, really, is to contact the owner, try to see if you can get compliance. If you don't, then you start documenting things with a letter. But to Paul's point, to keep, you keep the air out of it. Our office at this point would be involved in drafting the letter, talking with the code enforcement officer to make sure that they know what the issues are, what they should be discussing with the owner. But it's not, you know, somebody knocking on your door with a suit saying, hey, I want to talk to you before I go sue you on Friday. Mm -hmm. Keeping it measured, keeping it appropriate. Gaining access to the structure also Paul talked about. Um, much more often than the administrative search warrant, you're going to get access through consent. Um, the big difference is between going to somebody saying, I've got a complaint from a neighbor. I just... I don't have any idea. Let me just check and see if it's right versus, you know, saying you're a disaster and, you know, we're going to come after you. Most of the time you can get access through consent and you can get a good look at the problem that way before you even start to think about doing anything in court. But you do have the administrative search warrant proceeding available to you if you need it. And uh, as council member pointed out earlier, you do have to have probable cause to believe that code violations are present. What kind of timeline is there in that turnaround from submitting for that to actually being able to? For an administrative search warrant? Yes. Um, generally pretty quick. Okay. Uh, I think the last time we did it, Paul, it was maybe 10 days, two weeks, something like that. I mean, yeah. it, you know, once you get, usually you have a sort of break-in period because administrative search warrants happen so rarely that you sort of get the court staff that looks at you sideways when you come in with this thing. But once they realize it's more or less like the same warrant that they do every day for criminal purposes, then you just get in and get it knocked mm -hmm. right out. So the next step is a formal demand for compliance. Um, this is where you really start to move from an interactive process where you're, you know, people are proceeding in good faith and you're trying to get compliance to where you think that you're going to have litigation. This is usually a letter uh, drafted by our office where you use the data that you collected through the consented search or through the administrative search warrant search and itemize. These are all the issues that we're requesting that you fix. This all needs to happen by such and such a date or else we're going to put you on the next city council agenda after that for appropriate council action. Um, failure to do that then will uh, result in a show cause hearing if nothing's happening. Um, the alternative that you see is, um, and we had this happen once in our situation, uh, if you have somebody who disagrees with you, who's actually engaged, they may take an appeal. Um, usually that appeal, at least in the case of uh, the unsafe structures ordinance in Brighton, is to the city council. They come before council, make their pitch, and to your point, you can make your decision as to whether you think that the remedy that's being requested by staff is an appropriate one in this instance, given these facts. Again, a fact-specific case-by-case inquiry where um, you're hearing from staff and making a decision once you have the evidence in front of you. Over the years, with all these things, what I've always done is I, we write a letter that says, you know, you're not doing this, that, and the other thing, and you're going to be on the council agenda. <laughs> you know, um, Surprisingly, if they think they got to come down here and, and explain to you that they're not cutting their grass or getting the junk cars out, oftentimes it gets resolved. Or they come in with a plan. 
They said, we'll get the junk cars out of here in 10 days. And, you know, give us 10 days, don't sue us. And we go, okay, you get till the next council meeting or else. <laughs> you know, you give them one more chance, but it works. Well, like you said, compliance is what you're looking for. So right, so if they come down and they say, we got a plan, mm -hmm. I mean, quite frankly, court's the last option. So you, if you got a plan and a time deadline that's reasonable, usually council just gives it to them, you know. And Paul's absolutely right with the last piece of that, which is if it's reasonable. Because at the end of the day, uh, you know, when, it, when and if you decide to start doing this, you're going to hear a lot of plans. And some of them are going to be completely reasonable. And some of them are going to be, well, I figure by spring I can maybe get a car or two moved. And you go, come on, <laughs> you know. Um, so, but Paul's absolutely right. The amount of compliance that you get from somebody once you, they find out that they're going to have to go down to the principal's office and explain themselves on TV, um, it's pretty impressive. Well, especially now that you've established a history, they know that you're going to follow through on it. So, yeah. Right. You're going to tell them you're going to assume. That's a good stick. You tell them you're going to assume you need to sue them. Mm -hmm. Don't tell them you're going to sue them. No, no, right. Them, so, yeah. Exactly. And as Paul points out, the absolute last resort is to actually go to litigation. If you run them into counsel and they don't comply, you know, I can't say it any better than Paul did. If they come in, they don't comply, you need to sue them. Otherwise, that's what everybody's going to do. Um, it's going to be in the circuit court usually for smaller things like junk cars or people not cutting their grass, weeds get too long, things of that nature. District court's an appropriate uh, forum to go into. But if you're looking for real significant injunctive relief, and what I mean by that is you're looking to actually get them to do something, fix the roof, fix the wall, whatever it is, um, that's relief that you're going to want to get from the circuit court. Um, Litigation is not something to enter into lightly. Uh, it does involve substantial amount of time. It involves experts from both sides. And importantly, um, it's not just time from attorneys. There's a lot of staff time involved. Um, in some of these cases, I've spent a substantial amount of time with Jim Rowell or Amy Seifert, who's the planning director over at the city. Um, it takes up a, a lot of staff time. So. Uh, with that, we thank you for your time. We're more than happy to answer any other questions you may have, um, but we really appreciate the opportunity to come down tonight. Well, we're really happy for your last success because that particular man is into it for the sport, and um, I'm glad that you guys had the wherewithal and the, the willingness to go all the way. I had more hair. <laughs> 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 I have some questions, gentlemen. Um, just from your standpoint, uh, how I don't know what percentage, I don't know if you can state it, but how fast do you think that the real estate prices started rising in the downtown area? Demand for downtown property uh, began once you started coming in and dealing with the blight issues. Because I remember Brighton in the old days, and I'm clearly seeing it now in the new days. Um, it, it was pretty quick, but it, it really in retrospect, it, it's a, there's more than the blight thing has to happen. And, you know, the blight's one piece of it. We had a really active, uh, we did a liquor, a downtown development authority liquor license. There's a lot of drinking in Brighton now, a lot of restaurants, but uh, it's a, it became a $25,000 DDA liquor license that really changed a lot of the occupancies. And then uh, the DDA started doing the flower program, which was kind of the opposite of blight, making it prettier and the walkable community kind of stuff. So all of a sudden it kind of started coming together. Um, even in the down, down economy, it was still coming together. But it, it kind of that's why we, when we talk about putting – the list of all the things that you've got to fix, it's in conjunction with your planning department. Because if one quadrant of town's not happening, you might move that stuff up on the list because you have to try to jumpstart that quadrant of town. So we kind of moved it around in conjunction with planning, in conjunction with the, the downtown uh, merchants and so on and so forth. 
but pretty quickly um, is to answer your question. It certainly helps because um, if you're going to spend a bunch of money downtown, you don't want a crummy building next to, next to you. Mm -hmm. It's that simple, you know. Was it as helpful in that Grand River corridor as it was in the actual downtown? It was uh, because uh, if you get out of the core downtown, we kind of had some mixed industrial uses, uh, trucks out Hot front. Um, Old bad planning, you know, I mean, it was. It's just stuff that just uh, was kind of old world, if you will. It was there, they're long time, you know, residents of the community, but it's not fit in the modern world anymore. It needed to be moved to the back or off of Grand River or off of the storefronts and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But you definitely got to get the trucks out of the front yard, the garbage out of the yard, the junk cars out of the yard, and then things start moving along. Did you use any of that? Uh, what was the Keo? What's that? Um, mm -hmm. Ah, shoot. The eminent domain business. I forgot the, the town. Keo case? Yeah, yeah. Uh, were you able to use that in that corridor to just say, you know, we can get a better return on redeveloping this particular property? You know, you've got kind of just a a junk hole here, so we want you to tear that down and uh, that yes, and up something fancy. Uh, yes, yeah, so the um, uh, the DDA did a lot of those kinds of things, and um, you, you try to move businesses. For example, Home Depot is a different kind of business than a downtown hardware store, so you have to find businesses in the downtown that don't compete with a Walmart, for example. So you have to find that mix. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, my office really had nothing to do with it, but the DD, we, when we worked on this, we knew what the DDA was trying to do. So you try to facilitate it together. So we clean up so that the DDA can kind of energize another piece of town. And the DDA was buying property too and knocking buildings down too. If you take um, right, uh, kind of, if you know where Champs is, and there was old Dairy Mart there, the DDA just bought that, knocked it down. It's going to be parking. Uh, there was an old office building right behind that. The DDA knocked it down, parking. Um, so there were some purchases done to kind of get parking for the downtown storefronts. Yeah, it sounds like. But it sounds like the city of Brighton decided that, hey, if we're going to do this, work on our blight enforcement, we're also going to spend some money on the infrastructure. And it was like a combination project where the city said, we're going to spend the money and we're going to do it. We're not just going to do it, you know, like one piece at a time. We're going to try to get this all going. About the you you work on it all different facets. And I think that the trick bag in retrospect, you know, kind of we were doing whatever we could do as we could do it. But the trick bag has always been. Uh, getting your town town healthy is really a trick bag when you got a Walmart out on the other side of town where you can buy everything you know so how do you find these businesses that uh, are economically you know have some vitality you know when you can buy rubber balls at Walmart for you can't compete on some of these kinds of things so really getting that mix is was a Seems yeah, like they have to spend money for the the parking lots and stuff, but you you give up that the tiff of what I mean that was earning something, so yeah, you kind of give up. Some well, of that tiff. you're you're really trying to by doing all this, you're trying to entice investment downtown. And how did you do that? Entice the investment. Well, that's what I'm saying is you know part of this is planning, not the uh, but definitely making it nicer, definitely making safer, definitely making it walkable. Definitely figure out what your assets, your key assets are. Like we have the mill pond, You're getting that in the game, getting the flowers downtown, uh, getting parking, the uh, liquor licenses downtown. All of that stuff started really coming That's together true. at once, and all of a sudden people want to be downtown, they want to shop, and they want to go have dinner. And then, so we're finding that town is busy more nights and weekends than it is during a Tuesday afternoon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And so it, I'd like to I'll say a lot of it was all brilliant planning, but some of it was happenstance and just, you know, worked out fine. Well, it seems very methodical. I mean, when you used a couple of words that I've been kind of throwing out there, and I, when you say engaged and you say synergy, those are together, work together hand in hand. But 
all the amount of effort and work that was gone that went into it on the city side, how hard was it to pull all the groups together to kind of work in conjunction with each other? Because we've kind of had a not a great working group all these years. You know, I mean, we've worked together, but we all haven't been on the same page totally, and it's partially our fault. Right. Partially, you know, um, you know, and it's like, but so how hard was it, and how once the synergy starts and once they see the commitment. It, it 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 wasn't all that hard once it got out of the box. It was kind of hard getting out of the out of the chute because it's all new to everybody. And then, but once you get out of the box and everybody understands, you know, this is what we need to make town go, and because you know, everybody does their part. But you got to kind of create a, you know, like these are all the problem spots. These are all the spots we're gonna fix. How are we gonna fix it? We're gonna send a ticket, are we gonna rezone it, are we gonna put flowers out there? Are we gonna start with the quadrant of town that's having troubles, you know, so on and so forth. And you get it all up on a map and do it. But the first part seems like we got to have our codes and our ordinances yeah, yeah, and in, in sync with what's going on today and not what went on 50, <laughs> 60 years ago. You know, I mean, we have to be able to start with that and then Right. Be able to use that to to make things. And I guess the point we're trying to make, I'm trying to make anyways, it's not really all enforcement heavy handed no. stuff. It's uh, getting everybody in the community to understand this is what you got to do. You know, you want all your neighbors to clean up their yard so your house is worth more. It's really that simple. But somehow, you know, especially if you have owners that don't live in town either, that's another issue, you know. That's a big problem here. You know, that's so they're just. Language, yeah whatever yeah. but what if they know that these are the rules those are the rules um, in regards to I have as a note make a list of professionals within the community to come together and congregate to share the vision on your behalf who was your list of professionals Were there people from outside sources or people within the city or a mixture of both are you pulling architects? it was a, it was a pulling? mixture of both um, okay. we uh, of course, we, we've been there a long time, but uh, planning, code enforcement, you need a code enforcement people who can testify and want to get after it. Um, but planning, it, it was mostly the professional staff, and then the professional staff brings it to the city council. You know, we kind of serve it up and say, and you debate it at your retreat or whatever, but you know, what do you want to do? Yeah. You want to have a sidewalk program? Here's how you finance it. Okay. You know, so I'm but it was buying buy-in from all those <coughs> or the various groups is a lot easier if you have a master plan that everybody sees as a good goal to be shooting. Yeah, for. I think that's the issue. I think now that we're talking about it here is you, you get the this, and it's it's a nuts and bolts plan. It's not a pie in the sky plan. It's like right. we're gonna get the cars out of Third Street. <laughs> yeah, we've got all kinds of pretty drawings, but if you don't have a big bucket of money and you don't it have was, the ability to make the changes necessary to make that happen, yeah, this is not. We're gonna do something in five years. We're gonna do this in the next eighteen months. And uh, but then council's got to get behind it because staff gets a lot of flack, and you guys get some flack. And but if it's metered out and planned out really uh, your community thanks you for it because there's a lot of people sometimes the people who uh, are the least vocal you know it's very rare that when people come here and say you are doing the best job i've ever seen in my life <laughs> 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 thank you i'm going home pizza for everybody <laughs> you know it's you know you, you tend to get a lot of complaints rather than uh, the positive feedback when you serve as you guys are serving you know so but that's why when you put it together, it's in a real professional way, in a way that makes you guys look good, not heavy handed. And that's a fine line. Mm -hmm. If that makes any sense to you, it's just, you know, so. I'd like to ask a couple of questions regarding the litigation. How many pieces of property did you actually have to litigate? Uh, well, this round, uh, it was two, two parcels, right, Brad? And Davis Office Center. Oh. Uh, this this round, the last one was two. Where the, you know where the Davis Health Center is? It's now a. Uh, it's across the street from uh, Red Robin. Mm -hmm. We had we worked to have that demolished, and it's now a whole new development. And then uh, just a couple more, but no more than a handful. 
overall. So litigation is not uh, something that you're going to have a lot of. Uh, most property owners don't want it. I mean, the last thing anybody wants to do really is pay lawyers. We hear it every day, you know. <laughs> and so even the property owners, they don't want to be paying lawyers either. So if you, and the last thing you really want to do is be in court a lot because it's just cumbersome and expensive. So you're doing everything you can through this list. This is from me doing this from years so that you don't end up in court, mm -hmm. which is... Uh, so, again, Last resort. Again, talking about the litigation, um, I assume that you have expert witnesses that you have worked with over the years or have, that, that you have in your toolbox? Yeah, that, we, we have a SWAT team of okay. Okay. code enforcement, electrical inspector, plumbing inspector, Brad to handle most of this, architect. Architecture, engineers. Yep. That's, that's the team that goes in with the administrative search warrant. We have them all lined up from the get-go. And they've all testified? Uh, let's see. Uh, our building officials testified numerous times. Uh, our architects testified. Our engineers testified. I think some of the individual trades haven't as much, but certainly the, the big three there, multiple times. Okay, so you've got a good bank of expert witnesses. Can you talk a little bit about attorney fees? Have you been successful in recovering any attorney fees? Have any theories that you're using to try to recover attorney fees? We ask for them, and traditionally the judges don't grant them. Mm -hmm. They view uh, code enforcement as the cost of being in government. That's part of the tax rolls for you to spend, so, just like you spend money on police and fire and every other thing, tax assessing. It's just the cost of being in government, and every community is going to have 10 recalcitrant people. and So they'll they'll order it, but... It's defendant-driven because the defendant has to do something that's so ridiculous that it offends the judge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then they order it because they're mad in the courtroom. But we're mad earlier, you know. But it's you really can't count on it. You have to put money in your budget to do this. And it's a cost of, you know, you spend money on fire and police and so on and so forth. It just needs to be part of your budget process until. But the funny thing about it is, is uh, you get past it then it, because you don't have to do it as much after a while. There's like a, mm -hmm. a curve, and you, then you, you nip it in the bud, and then, I mean, other than the, and Another know. question on the litigation. Um, the, the one case I'm very familiar with that went to the Supreme Court, I followed it um, uh, <laughs> a lot. Uh, there yeah. were, <laughs> no, that's okay. It was great reading. It was a very, very good case, and you ought to be commended. Uh, very, very good lawyering. Uh, but as to the time period in terms of the average length of litigation, are you, are you talking about under a year, a little bit over a year when they said? And I'd like to take the Supreme Court case off the table because I think that was probably If you take that off, as you, as you know, the, the Supreme yeah. Court guidelines are two years to trial in the circuit court and two years, a year and a half to two years in the Court of Appeals if you go there. So the, the, the circuit court judges are supposed to have their cases done two years from the time of filing. If you're in the circuit court, and if you're in the district court, they're supposed to have 90 days from the time of filing with the tickets. So if you try to go district court, if you can get it done because you're in and out of there in 90 days. If you're heading for a circuit court, as you know, it's Slowville. Um, but you got to plan on a two-year gig up there to get to trial unless you can resolve it. Your experts, are they uh, your city officials, are like the city inspectors, or are they uh, actually people, other people that you think? Uh, the uh, Brad work, there's a gentleman by the name of Jim Rowell who was the city building inspector. He is now the county building inspector for Livingston County. Um, we, used, um, we used them by contract now, but he's, he's a seasoned expert. Um, he's kind of critical because he covers the gambit of violations. Uh, Tetra Tech is the city engineers. If we have structural problems, Lind out and Associates is the architect that we used. Uh, Mike Kennedy and the, a, a raft of <coughs> plumbing inspector, electrical inspector that just address. Right, but were these city inspectors or by contract? They're or by contract. They? Okay, so they weren't somebody that you hired out, like the experts that we... No, we used <coughs> okay. the people we knew who we started the program with. Okay. All right. 
So when we started the program, we got in the room and we created this list. They were in the room and we created the list. Okay. You know, so. Yeah, but those ex experts could transfer over here. I Correct. Mean, an expert's an expert. I mean, yeah. You, I mean, you're, you're dealing with state codes. You're basically dealing with the same kind of things that you're litigating in South Lyon or <coughs> County than you would be in Brighton. So it's not like you're changing jurisdictions that far where your experts are going to be that different. No. So you, yeah. you literally could bring along the experts. Yeah. I th yeah. <coughs> yes. Give us their rate structure. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have to pay. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the Jim Rout, the county is, you know, they weren't any more expensive than any other governmental entity. Yeah. But, but the, the <coughs> advantage to you having your experts is that we don't have to train <coughs> experts. We don't have to go look for experts. I mean, your experts have already been prepped. They know how to handle litigation. You know, they've probably been in a witness stand. They've probably had a depth taken. So there's an extreme advantage with expert witnesses that are already prepped and ready to go. But the problem is you have to make a distinguish, or you have to distinguish whether they are the inspectors that the city of Brighton is using by contract versus experts that you hire outside of a contract just to handle the litigation. Right, you, you, but you ha you'd have That's to. That's the distinction. I mean, it's my understanding that the your experts are actually the inspectors that the city of Brighton <coughs> has a contract with to perform those type of inspections, right? Uh, or are they are they experts that you have actually retained outside? It's a, of it's a mix. It's a mix. Okay. Right. It's a mix of both. It's whatever we needed for whatever type of property. Okay. Uh, like the architects kind of, a, but we need somebody to make some structural calcul calculations of walls, and so we need somebody could testify to that. Okay. You know. We One also thing need about your guys though. I mean, they've already established their credibility in the court, so it's. It's nice to not start from scratch and have to build that relationship with the judge. Yeah, we all got uh, we got some uh, knife wounds. <laughs> you know, you we you learn by experience. There's no question about it, and uh, uh, you know that's kind of the way it goes down. But again, the goal is to not get there. But you have to be ready in case you are there. You know, so you plan for the worst and hope for the best, kind of. Yeah. So, so that's that's our story, anyway. So. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Under new business number three, we have uh, an appointment and, and a resignation um, from some city commissions. Um, one is John Spencer is resigning from the Cultural Arts Commission. Well, I'll move that we accept Mr. Spencer's resignation with thanks for his service. Aye. And we have an appointment of Josie Kearns to the Cultural Arts Commission. Is Ms. Kearns present? Um, I don't believe she is, no. She does have a Master in Fine Arts. Um, she comes highly re recommended. She's been working ad hoc with the Cultural Arts Commission to date, and she's very interested in being a member of the Cultural Arts Commission. <coughs> I just had some inquiries to make regarding this. Um, her <coughs> credentials look great, and I think it's a added plus, a huge advantage to have grant writing as one of your qualities. Um, but I just wanted to kind of question, has she written grants before, or does she just have that as part of her degree? If she has, what kind of grants? Is she familiar with this? Um, I believe she's written uh, some arts grants in past uh, job experiences, and so that's, uh, and I do know she helped with the DIA grant that they applied for last summer. Excellent. Thank you. Just to add a little comment about Josie Kearns, mm -hmm. I know her by her talent, by her craft. Okay. She's a poet. Oh, that's fantastic. She was one of the poets that appeared at Three <coughs> Brewery and provided that phenomenal evening. A very, very seasoned University of Michigan um, employee. So she, she, she brings, uh, from what I understand, some pretty great talent to the Cultural Arts Commission. But that's who she is. She yeah. sounds like an asset. Yeah. Well, we need to fill that seat. 
I make a motion that we approve Josie Kearns to the uh, Cultural it's Arts it's Commission. Your appointment. He should second, second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 So Josie gets appointed to the Cultural Arts Commission. <coughs> she should come into City Hall to be sworn in and stuff? Yes. Yeah. Okay, number four has been removed. Uh, number five, consider dedication of Lexington Place condominiums water and wastewater utilities to the city. Okay, Mr. Martin, <coughs> Wilhelm, Mike Darga from HRC and I have been working with Robertson Brothers okay, on okay, getting the anything. utilities, water, wastewater dedicated. Um, <coughs> they have gone through all the necessary steps. Um, submitted all of the necessary documentation, recorded all the necessary paperwork with the county. And at this point, um, unless there are any questions from the council, I do believe we are ready to um, proceed with the acceptance of the dedication of the water and sanitary sewer utilities for the Lexington Place condominium development. Ms. Mann? Yes. <clears throat> questions? I had some questions for the city attorney. Yes. <clears throat> when when did this condo development close out? I, I thought that the developer was off the property since nineteen. I mean, two thousand thirteen. I don't have details on when the developer may have sold. Are you talking about selling the last unit? Yes. I don't have details on that. Well, it's just a question, and I think probably a little bit of investigation might be a little bit helpful. In many aspects, this particular development, <coughs> in terms of the dedication of the utilities, isn't that much different from Lafayette Woods. And Lafayette Woods was a condominium <coughs> association. And, and you have developer rights up to a certain point when you are <coughs> dealing with condos. You know, I'm not talking about plats. Um, this is now a, a condominium development. So at some point, when the, under the Condominium Act, when X amount of those properties are all sold, the developer, unless there's been some, reserva some reservation of the developer's rights beyond the sellout, the property really belongs to the condominium owners. So it, yeah. Well, so, it, so in my mind, I'm looking at this, and that becomes a real critical issue because the developer <clears throat> may not have the ability to make the dedication if the condo association <clears throat> had already been certificated to all the units. So that's why I asked, and, 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 I, and there's some further evidence here. When you go to the attachment where it says easements and encumbrances, if you go to that attachment that, that was attached to the dedication documents, you look at paragraph A and you look at paragraph C. And if you go into that language, it will say, um, after certificates of occupancy are issued for residences, you see that language? Yep. In 100% of the units that may have been established in the condominium, the foregoing rights and powers may be exercised by the association. So I have a question <laughs> as to whether the developer can even exercise any rights to dedicate these utilities because under the Condominium Act, I would assume that those rights have now been reserved to the homeowner association under, under their own document. Well, it does, though, right? it does talk about a permissive may. So the, the reservation of rights in paragraph C is clearly reserved to the developer if after 100% of the certificates of occupancy <coughs> grant are issued, then the association may. I don't think that's an exclusion to the developer's reservation of rights to dedicate. You probably should have a document under oath by the developer that says that the developer believes that the developer is free to exercise rights in lieu of the 100% occupancy. Maybe the homeowner association doesn't realize that they are entitled to make this dedication rather than the developer. 
So I think I would cover this transaction a little bit and just put the developer a little bit more on, um, on notice under oath in a, in a notarized document that either he has spoken to the homeowner association or, or that he has the right to exercise the right to dedicate not the homeowner association? Question when she's done. You, I mean, you understand what I'm talking about? Uh, I do. I just, uh, I guess the only difference would be asking the developer to, to put something in an affidavit type form. Yep. That they have this authority. That they have the authority. Aside because from, what's coming into question is that the development has, in fact, certificated out. So there is that question as to whether or not he properly has the rights to make this dedication under the master deed. I would just clean up the documentation. I, I see your point. I, I think that based on the assignment that's here, I think the developer has that right under the master deed. But when you look at the assignment, <laughs> the developer under the documents, under the Condominium Act, has the right to assign his development rights. And that's what he did in an assignment dated in 2014. But the documents that are actually the easement documents for the dedication of the utilities are dated in 2015. And it's that area in there where the homeowner association, doesn't matter, in, in my mind, it doesn't matter who he assigned his development rights to at this point, <clears throat> because it's possible that the homeowner association is actually in control of this dedication. I mean, it's a technical real estate legal issue, but I think you have to get past it from a documentation standpoint. Well, why don't you just have the association sign off? Or you can have the association yeah, I think, sign. I think it becomes a belt and suspenders. I clear. I think that. I mean, the, you make the call, but I'm just saying it's an issue. I think it should be resolved. It gets resolved either by the developer, um, if he wants to put something under oath, um, or or make the homeowner association do a consent and agreement, do a consent document where they consent to the dedication. I mean, that, that would be my preference, would yeah, be to have an affirmative that. action by the, by the homeowner. But I think the documentation needs to be cleaned up. The objective is still going to be fulfilled either way, though. So. doesn't matter. you got to do it They're right. They're not going to care. I, I well, think it, I it think eliminates any issue, yes, no, given that there may be authority on either of those, yeah. still the developer to or the association. Yeah. If we get something from both of them, then I think we've I, covered both bases. I have a question. I, I see that on our uh, discussion here, it's for the uh, water and wastewater utilities, and there's no mention of roads. Are the roads included, or no? no. no. And, and why is that? We've the, never taken any roads over in any dedication process. Well, I think if you look at the master deed, if you look at that uh, first paragraph, Harvey, on that document on the master deed, it says that they did not intend to dedicate to dedicate the roads. So there never was any intent from the developer to. Uh, okay, I've seen roads listed in there. A They're mentioned times. in the easements. So to ingress and egress on the second attachment, assignment of developer's rights, section B. Yeah, if you, but but if you also look at what I believe is their um, master deed, it's right here, page ten. It's in section article seven. Section A, look at that last sentence. Notwithstanding the foregoing, the developer does not presently intend to dedicate the roads within the condominium to public use. Okay. So they, they just took that issue off the table. The roads don't come close to meeting our standards. Exactly. Well, that was, that was going to be my next question. Yeah, that's exactly it. <laughs> so we're going to put this over to the next meeting then? Mm -hmm. Whenever it's ready to come back. Yeah, I, it may, I'll have to figure out um, how to approach this issue, whether it's the association or just the developer. My preference would be to get something from the association. It's affirmative, and it may take a little time, given the holidays, to, uh, to have them execute and schedule a meeting and get it done. So I'll, I'll bring it back through the city manager to be placed on an agenda. Thank you. you may, council may want to... Uh, entertain a motion to postpone, <coughs> which is an indefinite time period, or table indefinitely, until it comes back. I make a motion that we uh, table this matter, the matter which is um, item five under new business, the consideration of dedicating the utilities, waste and water uh, at Lexington Place condominiums to a future date, January 2016. 
Is this time sensitive or no? I don't um, think it is, is it? Well, there is one issue associated with this that is time sensitive. Um, you'll notice the last sentence of the suggested motion. The city currently has a cash surety bond for Robinson, Robinson Brothers that was part of a consent agreement um, ordered by the court. It's a $100,000 cash surety bond in an interest-bearing account, and the developer has asked for that back before the end of the calendar year. Um, so there is some time sensitivity to that portion of it. Well, you just asked for it back. You're not under a court order to give it to them, are you? No, I'm not. Okay. So he waits. Okay. Yeah, we really can't do that without having this fulfilled. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Further discussion? Pete's true value status of the site plan approval discussion. Uh, this was a discussion item that uh, Councilman Kurtzweil asked to be placed on the agenda. Yeah, I, this this will probably be more of a discussion under the downtown when we talk about downtown. Uh, I don't know, uh, Lynn, have you had an opportunity to find out what the status is? I have. And one moment. I don't know that I didn't get this passed out before the meeting. I have a memo from the city planner. He had to be at another meeting this evening, so Thank you. he could not attend. <laughs> don't. <laughs> Per uh, Mr. Aventini, the city's planner, the status of the site plan for the Peters True Value storage building was received by the Planning Commission approval from approximately one year ago. A demolition permit was issued for the mill building earlier this year, and that structure was raised. The site plan approval was granted for construction of a new storage building in its place, and a building permit has not yet been applied for. Under Section 102.131 expiration, the approval of any site plan under provisions of this article shall expire one year after the date that that site plan approval is given, whether it is preliminary or final site plan approval, unless actual construction and development have been commenced within the time limitations of the original one-year approval period and construction is in conformity with the approved site, final site plan. The Planning Commission approved the site plan with conditions at the December 4 meeting in 2014. The commissioners, however, wanted to see revisions to that plan prior to granting administrative approval. The revised plan addressing those conditions was established by the Planning Commission, was presented and accepted at the January 8, 2015 meeting. Uh, the ordinance also states that the building department shall not issue a building permit for any type of development or construction on the basis of any previously approved site plan when that approval has expired unless the site plan has received an extension from the Planning Commission or is reapproved. Since the building permit has not yet been issued for the project, the applicant will have to request an extension for placement on the January 2016 Planning Commission agenda or the site plan approval will expire. Just to ask for an extension then? Yes. So that is the current status of the site plan. Has anybody been keeping up to date with them? Kelly is in the process. The Kelly is in the process of getting all of the records up to date, and she has contacted the property owner to let them know that that is the status. Okay, I'll continue my conversation when we get to the downtown. Thank you. Okay, discussion for performance bonds. 
And again, this was an item put on the agenda by Councilwoman Kurzweil. Because we're working with the businesses, this is one aspect of working with businesses where I think we can improve how we are delivering services to the business community. Uh, there, there has been an issue with uh, a cash performance bond. Um, I've done some additional research. And, and Lynn, I just don't know, have you had an opportunity to look into performance bonds or? I have done research. I've also contacted our city auditor on them, yes. Okay. Uh, because it's kind of important that, that we're all sort of on the same page. Uh, this particular performance bond, I think we're now into our seventh month of getting this cash bond closed out. Is the Robertson Brothers a cash bond also, or is that, or is that a surety? I'm it is sure. a uh, surety cash bond that was a consent sent. They gave us a check that was required by the courts to be put into a separate interest-bearing account. Okay. Uh, because that's going to be important, so this is probably uh, an important discussion. Uh, performance bonds are contracts. I mean, that's what they are. It's a contract. And if you don't have anything in writing as to what the terms are of that contract, you're sort of opening the door to litigation. So I was a little bit surprised to learn that the performance bond on the one business owner in town, there is no written document, there's no nothing. So you have a business owner that is attempting to get the bond back and they were only given $3,800. And so we have this extra money from the bond that was not returned to the business owner. And I, for the life of me, can't figure out what authority the city is relying on to make the deduction that they made. If, if, if all the city is looking for is to have somebody pay review fees, then that becomes an invoice issue. You know, you have, you have two issues here. You know, they, they pay to have the site reviewed to make sure that they've complied with the request for the performance bond. But then they put the money down, but where is the city getting the authority to take a deduction out of that bond? Performance bonds, when they're paid in cash, and I talked about this, you know, several weeks ago, is you return, <coughs> you return the money. If, if there's fees that need to be paid, then that becomes an invoice issue. You send them an invoice and you say, Here is, here's what you owe the city for reviewing this, for reviewing that, for reviewing this. I don't see what authority this city had to take, that, to take any money out of that cash bond. And so my question is, is what authority do you have? Which business are we talking about? Well, I will point out two things here. Okay. Number one, um, I think this is a potential conflict of interest. No offense, Councilwoman, I'm but not you have an established business relationship as a lawyer co client with this business no, owner. I don't. You have in the past, yes. In the past, but I don't have one, haven't had one for several years. But that's not um, the issue. I, I believe that is an issue. And well, I hate to interrupt, but we have, I don't know if I'm speaking for everybody, but we have no idea what you're talking about. It's a generic issue, though. It's a generic I mean, a issue. Well, I understand that, but usually when we have a discussion, we have something in writing so we could kind of take a look well, at I it. I would have liked to have yeah, something. Yeah, kind of get an idea of what we were talking about rather yeah. than having a discussion on, on the fly, something right. that, I apologize, wasn't at the last meeting, but I have no clue what we're talking about. And now we're talking about a potential conflict and we're also talking about, it sounds like a particular business, and we don't know the reason for the performance It might end bond. up being a particular business, but it's a generic issue. Well, right? The way that we conduct it's just, our performance it's, it's, bond. It's how, you, it's how the city is <clears throat> closing out its performance bonds. Well, I'd like to know a little bit of history of the performance bonds. Well, don't you think that if... if are you suggesting that the performance bond should be used as a last resort in the event that they don't pay off the invoices for paying for the services no, that they're to, responsible for? That, that you have to agree. That's what I'm trying to say. The performance bond guarantees the performance of the job. Mm -hmm. Once the job has been performed, the job, that's all the performance bond guarantees is the performance of the job. 
if there's anything else that's to be deducted out of a performance bond, you, you should have that in writing so that the other party knows what deductions, what offsets are going to be made from that bond. You just don't go into a cash bond and say, I'm taking money out for this and money out for that and money out for this. If, if I owe you money, then send me an invoice, a separate invoice that's separate from the bond, but return the bond. And there's no doubt that, per, let's assume these facts. Job was performed, city wrote off on it, business owner now says, I want my cash bond back. To me, it's a very simple business issue. I think that this is clearly, though, this is a historic past practices. This is all the way, or the way it's always been conducted here. Someone's doing a project, there's review costs and things, and they're pulled from that performance bond. That's just the way it's always been done. I don't know if that has been done, because I've spoken to other business owners where the cash bond has been returned in full. In full. Yes. And a separate invoice has been sent regarding review fees. Hmm. And I think what it does is that if you put the terms of your bond. Well, I think it, it makes perfect sense to uh, outline exactly what it's All you do, to. I mean, you can do it in three or four sentences and say, thank you for providing a cash bond. <clears throat> this cash bond will secure the performance of a job approved by the Planning Commission on such and such a date, put down whatever, whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. And if you want review fees to be deducted out of it, you say, at the time the job has been completed and written off by the city, if you have any outstanding fees, then we will make a deduction out of that, blah, blah, blah. If the owner says, I don't want you deducting anything out of it, I want my full bond back, just send me an invoice for whatever fees they're doing. Because when you're dealing with a bond, you're dealing with, it's a contract. So there's a six-year statute of limitations on this contract until it gets closed out. So you're opening yourself up for six years of somebody coming back and saying, I didn't get all my money back. So why would you do that? Well, so well, I, think I, this, I, think, uh, I think this sounds to me as like that we take the business person out of it and Councilman Kibble states it very well that this is a It's a generic this issue. This is a generic issue that needs to be handled right. how all the performance. We just need to establish a, a need to establish a little there. tighter right. um, language on how so we all interpret it the same way as well and the and taking the personal business or whatever may be involved in this out of it can't come into play here. I mean, we have to do this. But, but you got to conduct the business. It, our business relationships have to be right, conducted. Right, but we can't, we, can't, we can't discuss individually every single business situation in yeah. this town or we'll never get any business done. Yeah, but you yes. need to have some procedures in place. That's, we're, that, not, we're that, not arguing that point. That are considered professional because right now, you know, <coughs> professionalism is not there particularly with performance bonds. Is it a big issue? No. But you know what? If you're going to start revitalizing the downtown, then there's going to be somebody who's going to come in and take a building down and build, and we're going to want a performance bond. Is there? I assume there's a performance bond on Knowles of South Lyon? A performance bond? Yes. No. No. There's not a performance bond on the Knowles of South Lyon. I think that was one of the negotiations. That's right. I, I'd have to double check on whether it's the performance bond, but for the utilities... They did not provide any security as a negotiating point in that development agreement. That was one of the things that they wanted negotiated out, and the council agreed with that. Well, you, you better hope he finishes. The it was a real risk. You're right. I mean, that, that's a tremendous risk. Mm -hmm. But that, that's for another day. But so my point is, is that I think just a one-page, couple sentences, that when people come in and, and deposit cash with the city, there's a couple of lines on it that say what can be deducted out of that cash bond. Because I think you have to get your procedures and make them clear so that there is no dispute that you don't have these issues. Anything we can do to, to lessen the ambiguity of how we process stuff is in our best interest. It, it, keeps, it keeps the city employees out of the mess. It keeps the city out of potential litigation because your your cash bonds could be greater than five thousand dollars. Yeah, you, you have a cash bond right now, Mr. For, Mayor. If I may, if I may, for, yeah. for what is it, a hundred thousand? Yes, Tom. that's that's a lot of money. Is is there a written? But Tom, Tom's got an answer. 
Oh. Go, go ahead. Is it, on, on, on this bond here, is there is there a written document that for says the, what you can or cannot? For the Robertson brothers? Mm -hmm. There is a court order based on the Robertson brothers, just, yes. Yeah, but what what are the terms of the of the bond? The terms of the bond is that the money had to be put into a separate interest earning account. But what are the terms of the actual bond itself? What deductions can you make out of that bond? So when he completes that project and dedicates the utilities, it's my understanding you're going to turn over to him $100,000. Without having to go to my office and get you the copy of the court order, I can't give you the exact details. Okay, so details. you see you have, you have no terms to this bond. No, there are terms. I would just have to get you the copy of the, the consent. I've got a copy of the consent and court order. I just don't have it in front of me. I mean, I think from a best practice standpoint, a bond is to secure certain completion or certain work to be completed. And we're going to, we need to establish a better escrow policy so that we're taking money in to do review fees and not be deducting review fees or anything else out of a performance bond. You know, that's a business decision. Yeah, that makes good You sense. know, th that's a business decision. If, if the city's policy is we will not deduct review fees out of the bonds, then, then that's fine. Or the city can make a decision and say, Normal practice, general practices, cash bonds, when the job is completed, everybody writes off, they get their money back. That's fine, too. The problem is, is you don't have anything in writing. You don't have anything <clears throat> that gives you the authority to deduct a dime out of those cash bonds. <clears throat> but if you want the additional security that you're now going to combine the performance bond with a little bit of a guarantee of payment, now you're talking about a payment bond where they're going to be responsible for paying all fees associated, including those with the performance. Right, but I, okay. I, think, I think the scenario that's before council right now involves cash, mm -hmm. and I think the word bond is modifying it, but there's a cash that's what it's payment. Called. It's called a cash bond. But there's, a, there's cash, and mm -hmm. returning the 5000 if mm -hmm. there were fees owning, owing, mm -hmm. I think it was a practical measure to say I'm going to deduct whatever I, I'm owed for review fees from that maybe not the best practice but I think that's what happened from a practical standpoint we should correct that I think I, that's what I would do we should, should separate those I, performance that's what bonds I would will do. be held separately and accounted for separately fees and costs will be billed and probably I think we ought to be collecting those up front as a deposit rather than trying to bill and collect after the fact so I, mean, that, I, I mean that's an administrative thing but I think Somebody needs to get it cleared up because right now it's very loose. You're opening yourself up for litigation uh, potentially, and so you do. That the, uh, so that the fees are all paid, which then completes the project, and then the cash, and then the bond is returned. Is that what you're saying? Can you repeat it? All, all of the old fees being owed to the city are paid by the developer or whatever it is, and that completes the job, and then the bond is returned the full bond. In full. Yes. Yes. Okay. So they're, they're separate. I amounts. just want to make sure I understand what you're saying. That separates it. Separate buckets. But the, one for performance, one for. But the fees. one, yeah, but the one has to happen before the other, correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you. And, and that that would be a perfect explanation to put on the bond. Your bond will be returned not only upon performance of the job, but upon the payment of the following invoices for. Additional fees, blah blah blah. So we're done here. So yeah, I think that. But you need this. to. <clears throat> we we've just uh, established. We all agree we need to establish some parameters yeah. a little bit stronger. I mean, one of the things that we talked about earlier, the Brighton <laughs> attorneys were here, is our ordinances and our codes and some of the language is a little bit antiquated for the time that we're in today, maybe. And some of the things are changing very drastically, very quickly in the real estate side and the development side. And this is probably one area we need to. Tighten up a little bit, you know, so the this, so this issues do not arise for anybody. And we need to understand them as a council as well. So, thank you. So, let's move this? along. Yeah, I'm ready to move on. Okay, we covered that. So, um, as requested, we have a discussion on Boyd Ordinance and Unsafe Structures placards. Do we have anything that we want to discuss on that beyond the presentation we had today? 
Maggie, thank you for bringing them in. Appreciate it. I think they're pretty talented. I think it was pretty informative. I mean, it, all it did, what it did do is tell us what we need to be doing, and, and I think we all know that already. I mean, that's... They provided some insight for yeah, us. Yeah, it was nice to see what they actually did and hear some of the insight on how mm -hmm. they tackled some of these matters with some yeah. of the same type of... And provided a pretty logical plan. Yeah, very I think what I was logical. surprised with is that it, it, it's not a rocket science type of thing. It doesn't have to be any harder than than what it, what it is. We don't need to make it harder. Um, the plan seems simple, and I think that's something we're certainly capable of doing. They Absolutely. also gave us a timeline as to what to expect because, mm -hmm. I mean, I have no idea if should it be five years, should it be five months. So they gave us a very good timeline as well. And I was they surprised at the time. I was surprised at the yeah. length of it. Yeah, yeah. I, I was yeah, pleasantly like surprised with that. It gives us a point to jump off of. Yeah, but well, it gives us some expectation at least exactly. of what we can hope. For. It seems like though the very methodical do it in the, in the order that they were laying out for us is this is what needs to be done and you can't jump over. <coughs> Which I think, I think it should be said, in the though, past a little bit. we've been moving in the direction of yeah. accomplishing what they're, they've ultimately fulfilled. Yeah, we have a lot of the pieces already there. So, um, you know, we have some, some things to tighten up and some mm -hmm. things like the, the property dangerous, dangerous, dangerous structures. Build, or dangerous structures stuff we need to address. Right. But um, the other <laughs> stuff we had been pushing towards that anyway. So mm -hmm. that's, that's cool to see. I think most of us had been kind of clamoring for the conclusion of, their, their deal with Bonner, and when they were successful with that, we figured that this is good, everything's in alignment, and if we glom on to what their success was, we'll be able to, to end up making some headway. So. Well, let's start the clock then. <coughs> we, we have things kind of like piecemeal. Maybe it's time we set up like a committee that they had. No, that's absolutely got to be then let's part get of that it. going, and then that, let's start our own clock going so we can hopefully get it done within 18 months, yeah, but absolutely. at least get uh, things rolling on our end. But look what we've got going right now. This is a perfect convergence because we're at the brink of, of our master plan approval that gives everybody direction to push into the same, the same direction. So that coupled with trying to get these particular um, expertise grouped and aligned and organized will end up getting us, giving us the ability to, to find the answers we need, both to, to address the, the recalcitrant folks and to try to strategize the things that are the only um, obstacle that's in our way is money and what kind of structure in what location. Do we have, so, an, do we have an idea when the master plan is going to be? Uh... Well, March is, is when it will come to us is what, Planning Commission is saying so. The March. Planning Commission is holding their public hearing on the master plan in, on, I believe it's February 11th. So the master plan would come to the council in March. It's a, it's going to the surrounding communities right now for their review, then the their public hearing, and then it'll come to us. Correct. And then we need to start making sure that the ordinances that we have are Support. actually yeah, right. Absolutely. Right. I would like to um, consider expediting the process and uh, hiring these two individuals. I'd like no. to see them. I, I don't, no. I think they've I got the that. expertise. They have the ability to do it. Um, I don't I think, think Rosati is a big firm with the I, I, same I, level of expertise. I, I think these individuals are probably better prepared. I just think that they are ready to go. They're ready to hit the ground. I'm not as uh, fond of uh, the Rosati law firm. I think that there are some weaknesses in terms of their ability to deliver uh, services. I think these two gentlemen have the ability to walk in here and literally have this have us ready to go within 60 days. Well, that's cool. That, then that's we not the discussion firm. today. That's no, not part not, of this but, discussion. But well, it is part of the discussion because you're talking about putting together people and, and putting together a plan and putting together who's going to be doing this and who's going to be doing that. And yet, I mean. that's one suggestion. Thank you and, for and, it. And, this and, is what I mean, though. We're jumping, we're jumping the shark a little bit here. Again, this is what we were trying to say before, is the reason why things haven't got done in the past is because we've thrown the ball back and forth. And we've had a, they did come in here and did a very adequate, eloquent job of laying out to us what we need to be doing mm -hmm. as a city. The information that we have available to us, we have. Mm -hmm. Parts of the puzzle are already in place. 
we know what we need to do to put into that puzzle to make it work. We now have the opportunity to use who we have available to us to do what needs to be done to make this happen. Whether it doesn't or not at that point in time, we can discuss that. But I think right now we already have what we need to make, to make some kind of decisions as a body and start <clears throat> moving forward on the ordinances and doing this as well first. We need that first. I'd use their ordinance. For the sake of time, though, if I may. Um, just for the sake of time tonight, maybe we could just table this and discuss hiring them next meeting, and we can explore the pros and cons then, because I know they're going to come with probably a hefty price tag, but is it worth the investment? Because what they could do for our city could be, I mean, worth it, absolutely. But I would like to explore more of the pros and the cons before we make any type of decision, and I also think for the sake of time right now probably isn't the best time to explore those options. Well, I'm just saying the last thing we need to do as a council is pay for two attorneys. Yeah, I agree. Special counsel. And that would be a con. Well, special counsel has special rates. And I mean, I think 18 that's months. A, 18 months at $200 an hour. Sure. Let's move on. Yes. Straight here after all this, <laughs> <laughs> all this, all the legal jargon going on here. <clears throat> so, a discussion with the downtown. We had this was asked to put on here on a running topic, which I think is a great idea. Um, not that it hasn't been discussed before, but I think it gives everybody an opportunity to kind of say a little something or nothing, you know. I mean, but at least shows that we're trying to accomplish something here, which is part of why the flight ordinance is kind of a hot topic, a big push button. So with that, let's uh, start the discussion with the downtown, if anybody has anything. I mean, how's the uh, the uh, demo going on the building? Looks good. The demo yeah. is going well. I have been staying in touch with the contractor on a regular basis. Um, I will look into the concerns that Mr. Richards brought up. The contract was supposed to be clear that they were supposed to remove any and all foundations, so I'm not sure why they're thinking that the uh, cement floor is supposed to remain. Um, the contract was reviewed by the city attorney before it was put out for bid, so I will follow up on that. Harvey. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. One thing we talked about at our last meeting um, um, peripherally, was expanding uh, the DDA, yes. the footprint of the DDA. Um, could you do a little research on that and uh, so we just have that information available to us when the time comes or have someone on your staff do that? I will actually, Kelly and I started looking into that today. The last time it was considered was in 2008 and so That's there's about right. a okay. very large file on it. Thank you. Yep. If you could get all the particulars too about what sunset timelines are available to do that. I really was attracted by um, Carmen's idea of or revaluing the downtown so that we could grow that TIF earlier, you know, instead of having to let things escalate to where they were before the downfall, so. Maggie? One of the reasons I wanted to bring up uh, the true value store is because I, I think this is just, it's, it, I don't know if it's an isolated case, although we do have another property um, that was going to do a, a, a very, very nice updated facade, and, and I don't think they've pulled um, permits either. But here you have a case where uh, if you're looking at improving the downtown, you also have to improve your approaches as you're coming into your downtown. So how does Lake Street look when you come into the downtown? It's just as important as um, the actual downtown itself. And I can recall when Pete's True Value came to the Planning Commission and he was so gung-ho on providing a new storage uh, facility that he was gonna put out there on the front where the old mill uh, stood. And as, <coughs> I don't know if any of you know, but on the Planning Commission there was a lot of discussion about taking down the mill because it was a historical site. And uh, some of us felt it should stay and they should renovate it. There were other individuals who said, take it down, but put a new storage facility on it. So we had this beautiful design uh, that was going to match the true value store. And when you drive past that corner now, all you have is just this, you know, fencing and you have grass. So here you have an, an attempt 
by the Planning Commission to improve the approach coming into the downtown area and a business owner that has not pulled a permit yet to do what the Planning Commission had um, approved, which was going to be a really nice addition to that corner. There is going to be great landscaping going in. It was going to match the building that's already there, and it would be a tremendous, and, and I talked about this at the last city council meeting, you know, investment blight, this inverse relationship. If people are not going to invest in this town, you're going to get blight. And here you had an opportunity where true value got what they wanted. He wanted that mill taken down because of the insurance premiums. It was costing him phenomenal amounts of money to insure a vacant building. He got what he wanted, but what did the city get? I mean, here we are getting ready for a site plan to expire, and he won't be back. Once it expires, chances are he probably won't be back. Now, I heard, and I don't know if it's true, that there has been another purchase of another hardware store in another community. So this property owner has the money, it's just not being spent in South Lyon. So how we remedy it, I don't know, but, but I just wanted to bring that to the attention of city council, that maybe we need to sit down with them and say, look, we have this corner, it doesn't look real good, here's the plans, look how nice this would look as an approach coming into our downtown area, when can we get you on schedule to get this done? I mean, I almost feel like betrayed. Well, the first part of that, it had to come down. I mean, sometimes sometimes historic structures are, I'm, I come from the real estate side and architectural engineering and design, and as much as you want to salvage something, sometimes it's unsalvageable financially to do it. You just can't do it. And the demo in this wasn't, case, it had, to come, it had to come down. The demo wasn't predicated on them building that yes, building. Yes, it was. No, that, I don't that, think that they were Yeah, that, that's what we approved. We, we agreed to permit the takedown in return for him building a storage bin that is similar in structure to the original uh, true value. Yeah. They didn't have a problem with it a year and a half ago or a year ago. How? Well, I don't know. I don't condemned. understand how the Planning Commission has the ability to prohibit someone from doing a demo on a property. That, that, but that's how, that's how it happened. It was never condemned. Language, it was that, never. That it, doesn't doesn't ring true. It, it was the, the building was never condemned. He was still using it. No, he wasn't. Yeah, the, he, there was actually it was topsoil wheelbarrows like parked outside of it. <clears throat> there was some product in it. I don't think whether he's using it or not using it was really the question. I mean, the building was a mess. The building was in really in bad shape. I love the building. I love the way it looked. It would have been nice to have it sitting there mm -hmm. and refurbished. But, in, but you can't force him to put money into something no. that isn't going to work. But now he had to take it down. Now he took it grass. down. Well, he hasn't applied for the permit and yet. Yeah. So. And it's a really nice structure. It's a real nice accessory building that would really look nice on that approach coming into the There's a lot area. of things in town that would look really nice if we told the builders and the owners of these properties to do them, and we don't have the authority to force someone to build something. No, but we can sit down and say, this is where we're going. I mean, if you take that kind of attitude, we'll never get the downtown well, that's done. Well, why, that's why I said we got to take, yeah. we got to not jump over yeah. everything. We have to do it methodically, or we get ourselves yeah. in a situation where nothing gets done. Yeah. And, and if this build was part of that site plan, and the demo, it was all one package. We should have some legal vehicle for a performance bond. You failed to be able to, to retain their performance bond then, shouldn't we? They, they never pulled the permit. Usually you get the bond when you pull the permit. That, that, that's why there, I asked. There was no bond put up no, when they, they did the demo. I don't know if they did the demo. I, I don't know if there was a bond for it. I mean, it seems kind of pointless to... To do it afterward, if the guy doesn't end up yeah. having anything to lose, then yeah, he's you, not you normally pull the don't permit. pull a bond until you pull the permit, and they haven't pulled. That's why I asked. He had We're, a demo permit. Yeah, but I'm talking about building the structure, the new accessory building. I'm just saying that if that the quarter. whole thing was tied together, and this is an obligation of that site plan approval, that the demolition can't be conducted unless you fulfill this site plan approval. Tim, what do you, what do you recall? Maybe Mr. it wasn't. Mr. Mayor, if I, if I can. Yeah. I, I don't have any recollection of the demolition being tied to the site plan approval. There was a discussion at one of the planning commission meetings about whether there was any historical designation to that structure or another vehicle or tool or mechanism or ordinance on which the city could rely on 
to regulate or control the demolition. But really, I think the conclusion that we came to was that the city couldn't prevent him from pulling a, a demolition permit and taking the building down. Okay. At the same time, he also applied for and intended to replace the building with the accessory building and went through and got a, a site plan approval. Mm -hmm. I, I went back and looked at the, when I saw this on the agenda, I went back and looked at the minutes. There doesn't seem to be any connection uh, in the planning commission between that demolition and the site plan approval. Okay, they stand corrected. Uh, that's your recollection. You know, so uh, if that's the case, then it's simple a business decision. He doesn't think he can get a return on the investment of that new building. If he does see in the future, he'll resubmit. We'll talk to him. Any other now, the downtown, though, I mean, it, so you're tied to that was the entrance <laughs> of downtown. You know what? If you want to go, why don't you just go? I mean, it, we're having a no, discussion. No. If you want to talk, keep talking. Yeah, we are sending such a mixed message to businesses that want to come to South Lawn. Yes, we are. No, we're saying, I, we're saying, hey, we'd love to have you come here, but then we're holding it, their hand to a fire, saying, hey, you didn't, you know, build this, whatever this new uh, storage facility. Therefore, I think we should punish you. That's basically the message well, we're the, saying. Well, I disagree, but well, I don't. Um, <laughs> well, let's 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 not go in this. I'm direction. just wondering what's the tie with the downtown. You're thinking that being the entrance of downtown. You know, because you've got that approach coming in. I mean, you're right there at Paul Baker Park, and and look at all the work that's been done at Paul Baker Park, and and you look at the homes that have been improved along Lake Street. You know, some of the the remodeling that has been done, and that's part of as you're coming into the downtown. I think you're you right know. there, but I mean, that's not really the, the the typical discussion on the downtown is the commercial aspect of it, isn't it? I mean, wouldn't you think? Well, you know, they work, they work on the approaches. That, that's what I'm trying to tell you is that when, when you're in that downtown area, I mean, they actually work on the approaches going into your downtown. I mean, that is part of the attraction is, is how nice, and you're only talking about, I think, two blocks you know, in that area. And, and, and you're right, Glenn, you know, do we, do we take that, that idea of the downtown and move it out just a little bit? And if we're gonna be doing blight busting, you know, there's, there's that house right there in Paul Baker Park. I mean, that's a house that should be designated. It's not in the downtown, but you know what I'm talking about. You know, I mean. I well, mean, I think so, that's in general though. I mean, that's the blight thing. That's not necessarily the no, downtown but, thing. But that's part of cleaning up that <laughs> kind of area in the downtown. It's not just the two blocks of downtown. If you move out a little bit, I'm not saying you gotta go all the way out to Milford Road, yeah. but I'd just like look at you. I'd like to focus on the, the literal downtown because I mean, we're, we're spread thin enough already. Yeah. We start taking this bigger project and I think it dilutes the potential I don't think there's much to do. I don't think so. there's much to do, but I mean, you got some good points. Well, on, on the downtown thing, I really hope that we can try to come to some kind of vision of how we can place our responsibilities of parking when that new master plan gets, gets adopted because we are responsible for all that stuff. So we're going to have to start identifying properties that we're going to want to end up gobbling up to turn into parking lots because there's not going to be any place for these new businesses to have their clientele park if they can build at zero lot line, um, I mean, it'll look pretty as heck, and then we'll have to have shuttle buses or something bring customers. That's, so we better start getting real about this. <coughs> oh, Mary, um, have you got, did you get a copy? Have you gotten a copy of this? What is it? Master, Master plan. plan. I have not. The draft copy. Yeah, I asked for it. I got one. But, I mean, I think you should get one, Maggie, because you're new to the council. I think you should get one. Can I and, get that email? And, and we should yep. okay, all make ourselves you. familiar with what's <coughs> here being we have, where we have some new people now on the board. Yeah, but absolutely. We, we need to be very aware that this is coming out. This is coming on board, you know. So um, what Glenn says, you know, is uh, very, very um, pertinent to what. Oh, yeah. I'll do my We're going to have a lot of situations that are going to come up that we've got in our plan that we have to address somehow, you know. So we need to be on board and be on the same page. Yes, sir. State your name. Uh, thank you, Ben Verish, 630 North Hagedorn. Um, forgive my ignorance because I just moved out here like two years ago. This is my first time to a, a, a meeting like this. Um, one of the things that you were just talking about that, that, that sparked in my mind is I grew up in downtown Plymouth, 
And um, one of the things that we built down there was a parking structure. And I don't know if you've ever been to downtown Plymouth, but it's really nice. Um, I think a lot of people like to go there. Pardon my I'm a little bit nervous, um, and I'm not normally. But um, since the erection of that um, parking structure that they built down there, that had a lot to do with the development overall and the expansion of the city down there. And uh, approaching Plymouth, um, I agree uh, that coming into it, uh, you, there are it's old residential that are now turned into businesses, uh, but it's still very, it has that, uh, it's one of the reasons I came here, I'll just say that. I came to South Lyon because it reminds me of Plymouth a lot. It has the hometown USA type feeling, and I would like to somehow just see that preserved. And um, I, I think it would be really, really good idea maybe for the council to uh, seek uh, the advice or counsel of other cities that have done this. I assume you're already doing that. Uh, one person in particular that I think you might want to reach out to might be Dan Gilbert. Um, as, as he will tell you uh, that you can have the best lawyers and you can have the best litigation and all this other stuff, but if you don't have a shared vision about what you want downtown South Lyon to be and look like, um, this is all just rhetoric. It, it, it doesn't matter. Like, none of this means anything. So I would start with, what do you guys want people to come here for? What do you want to be known for? Like, why would someone drive 45 miles to come to South Lyon? What do we have? That's what I would start with. How are you going to draw people? Why would they come here? And then once you have that shared vision, then I would suggest taking the next steps. And that's, thanks for letting me talk. Yeah, that's a real heavy undertaking, try to get everybody to vision the same vision. That's a real challenge. The big vision is you want people to come here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Of course. Thank you. Okay, I think we're good. So um, continue to talk about the downtown. I think it's important. Mixed messages or not mixed messages, I think we need to have the dialogue. That's all. Um, it's something that's needed to happen for a long time. And uh, it's not going to be simple. You know, so um, I think it's good. I think we also need to be willing to not talk about it. If there's nothing new, yes, absolutely. let's not just beat the crap out of this for just <laughs> absolutely. for the sake of talking about it. Okay, let's move on to the manager's report. Um, the one thing I have this evening, as I mentioned at the last meeting, um, I reached out and contacted three different potential uh, council retreat facilitators, one from the league, um, one from Eastern Michigan, and one other independent facilitator. Um, I have gotten a proposal from one. The other two are holding off on submitting proposals because they don't have dates available in January. Um, wanted to find out from the council if you are willing to push out a potential retreat into February or March. If so, that would give us a broader range of potential facilitators to seek proposals from. Um, if you are, if you can give me potential dates, because I know Saturdays work best for the council that I could provide to them, um, I can get back to them and then hopefully have proposals to bring on the 28th. Well, personally, I think that we should be going to Johnson Rosati. The idea of spending out of pocket to just visit and get to know each other is, is ridiculous. Well, uh, above and beyond location, just getting the, the proposals from the facilitators on what they would like to do, what their costs are, and how they would handle the retreats themselves um, is what I'm looking at. Oh, the facilitators. Yeah, not, the actual not facilitators, the not the locations. Do you want us to just email you dates that work best for us? Yes, if okay. you can. That's not a problem. If it's going to be on a Saturday, just let me know when it is. I'll know. Yeah, I think I I'm clear too. It. So I think it's a good idea. Okay, so you'd you'd be willing to look at a February date? Sure. No, I um I have the bar exam in February. I will be dead to the world. Oh, so. you, you don't need to study. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry about Thanks. it. Thanks. Yeah. Isn't that multiple choice? <laughs> yes. Part so. one. I think he was going to help you study. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 If February <laughs> is out, would March work for March the council? March would be excellent. Okay, I, I will talk to the facilitators. Yes. I had a question, Mr. Mayor. On, um, are we going to be making decisions? I assume at, at this or how? Because I took a look at the Open Meetings Act. It, it would be noticed as an open meeting, and it would be open to the public. And some of the case law in the Open Meetings Act, the more I was looking at this, requires more of a 
restriction in terms of um, jurisdiction as to where this goes. So maybe the Johnson Rosati alternative, when you look at the case law, would be out. Holiday Inn would be out. Eastern Michigan would be out. Because some of the case law appears to indicate that you need to stay within the jurisdiction of where you're at. I don't know. I'll, I'll let you sort of take a second look at that. But I'd be interested outside. in seeing what you found. I, I'd done yeah. some research on this and didn't see anything specific as to location. There is some caution in the case law that if you were to take, say, for example, go up to Traverse City and try and notice a, a public meeting there, it's really not a, a close enough distance to make it a meaningful open meeting. That may be a concern. Um, I did download the open meetings, uh, the Michigan Open Meetings Handbook yeah. um, that talked about locations and different things like that, and that's what I was using as a reference point for determining that we could hold it outside of the city of South Lyon. I think you can hold it outside the city of South Lyon, but it's within our basic jurisdiction so as not to become a hindrance to a public member that may want to attend the meeting. Well, could we flesh that out and just start yeah. looking for a date and then kind of Yeah, I, I would take a look at that because I did look at the case law and it, it said to stay within the jurisdiction. So we might be a little. I, I will continue to that and we'll flesh out a date and I will get proposals yeah. from the facilitators. Yep. And uh, beyond that, don't forget the holiday party this Wednesday at the South Lion Hotel on the second floor from 6 to 8. Look forward to seeing all of you and our volunteers and guests there. And um, beyond that, I uh, hope everybody has a Merry Christmas, and I will see you on the 28th. Okay, council comments. Glenn. Well, I want to apologize. I had been given um, Christmas decorations by Herb Stricker from Superb Fabricating. They're these wonderfully laser cut pieces of sheet metal. They're really pretty. I'll drop them off at each of your houses. I, they're sitting on my workbench at the house, so I, I don't know about that. Um, and the other thing was the cool Yule was, it, the weather couldn't have been more perfect, maybe not for the cool Yule, but I was enjoying it. And uh, uh, the access to the, the chapel to listen to the high school choir in there was an awful lot of fun. And it, it was just a nice event. Seeing the kids going up to Santa is always a, a lot of fun. You know, my kids are all grown up now, so, you know, when you see those little cuties going up there, you, you remember those days when they were little. So, But that was a, a real nice event. That's all I have. And uh, have a nice Christmas. And, oh, I guess we got another meeting yet. No, that's after no, that. That's yeah. After. So, yeah, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Save the Happy New Year. Okay, so you guys are going to hate me. I have a couple different things. I'll make it quick. All right. Um, newly elected officials training. I ended up going to the newly elected officials training last week. Thought it was incredibly informative. I spoke with a couple other people who elected officials who were there from different communities, and I told them about our downtown issues, and they informed me that multiple people from their community all said the same thing. Community said the same thing, that they hired grant writers to come in and that did a world of good for their communities and they brought in a lot of money. So I don't know if we can possibly put that on um, December 28th agenda to have grant writing, hiring a grant writer, or even if we have somebody who's available who is a grant writer and present to us what grants are out there, have we been applying for them? If we have people who have the ability to do that that we don't need to hire, excellent. Let's utilize that to the best of the abilities that we can and get as much free money as we can from whoever. So I think that needs to be our number one priority because it's not coming out of the taxpayers' pockets. So that's something I just wanted to mention. And also, secondly, did we ever follow up with Dr. Kaplan, the Road Commission? I just wanted to touch base regarding that. Yes. You did? Yes. How'd it go? And I did as well. I contacted the Road Commission immediately following um, the last meeting, and I had a follow-up meeting with them today. I also know that Councilman Kurtzweil and Dr. Kaplan were both at their meeting last week. Perfect. How'd it go? I can talk about, you want me to talk about it now? Really briefly, just like super quick. Um, 
it was a great meeting. It was a very professional group of individuals. Are they going to solve his problem? Well, they're, they're going to come out here and they're going to meet with him. And uh, they are very interested in, in working with South Lyon. That's when I learned that your meeting with them was canceled. You canceled it. Have you rescheduled it? Um, I had it this morning. I was ill last week, and so I was unable to attend. Yeah, and um, they were absolutely a, a wonderful, wonderful group of, of individuals, very interested in coming to South Lyon, very interested in developing, like I said, that relationship uh, with South Lyon. Uh, they're going to meet with Dr. Kaplan. Dr. Kaplan is a, uh, uh, just a great ambassador for South Lyon. He was Excellent. just wonderful. It, it was a very, very positive meeting. And uh, on that real quick, um, uh, Glenn, uh, I asked the question about uh, South Lyon not being on their menu drop, and that's a software problem that's going to be taken care of. So, there you go. Um, cool. so I followed up on that. They were just a fan. So they must love us. <laughs> I, I, I'm telling you, they were, they were an extremely professional group of individuals. It, they, Fantastic. Very, very welcoming, very, very interested in having somebody from South Lyon um, take an interest in coming out and meeting with them. They were wonderful. Thank you for addressing that. I appreciate it. Thank you. And I'm sure Dr. Kaplan appreciates it as well. Like, we need to take care of our business owners. Um, third, um, I received a phone call regarding our former mayor, Todd Wallace, and his issues regarding repayment. Um, did that ever get addressed? Whatever happened to that? Does that need to go on the agenda? I'm just asking because I just wanted to get some clarity. Um, as he chose not to come today, um, I am moving forward with past practice, and we are leaving it at that. So just to clarify, no one has been paid? No. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Um, fourth point, uh, I just wanted to quickly make a note that there was a dedication made to a fallen soldier who graduated a year after me. Um, Dominic was actually a very good guy, very fantastic person. And uh, gone too soon, but he actually, there was a football field, well, the South Lion football field is dedicated to Dominic. And I just wanted to point out that I think that our community is absolutely fantastic for doing that. So um, number five, Cool Yule. Good stuff, Cool Yule people who put that on. I didn't make it, but I have people who have kids that went, and they said it was amazing. So good stuff. Also, the city website, I don't know if we can put this on the agenda, but maybe updating that because it looks a little outdated, and there's some spelling errors that I caught as well. We're actually in the process of updating the website. We've just gotten all the pictures. We are uploading um, a informational sheet to the uh, company that we have contracted with, and we are in the process of moving over content, updating the yeah, entire website. We just website. need to get out of the 1980s. Yep. I'm really sorry, but that needs to yep. happen. And, like, do we have a timeline? Is that going to happen next year, two years from now? Um, it's going to happen hopefully within the next 12 weeks. Okay, excellent. Awesome. Thank you for addressing that. And lastly, happy holidays. Thanks to you guys for coming. I know you're falling asleep back there. Hang in there. <laughs> Harvey. I think I've said enough tonight. Merry Christmas, everyone. Mike. Yeah, Merry Christmas. Well, I got a couple things, as I'm sure people expected it. Um, I'm going to go back to the, uh, first of all, Lynn, uh, did you have those amendments to the budget? that you were going to provide? Um, I do. I forgot to bring them this evening. I will email them to that's you. A, that's perfect. And do we have the 2015-16 budget online yet? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, also, I would just want to thank the Oakland County Road Commission for putting the four-way stop in at Nine Mile and Griswold. Uh, they moved very, very quickly, I think within 60 days of the complaints that came uh, predominantly, I think, from the South Lyon area. They were very, very responsive, and I want to uh, publicly thank them for uh, listening. Uh, Lynn, I have a, a question for you, uh, only because I read the article in the paper, so about the 390 uh, Lafayette. Yes. And this is concerning the minimum that we can charge when we sell the property. There's a cap on it. Yes. Okay. How... Where, where did you see that? I'm just curious. That is a, um, it's actually not a minimum, it's a maximum we can charge on the property without turning over anything over that back to the county because we acquired it via back taxes. Yeah, okay, that's key because the article in the paper did not say that you can charge in excess because you can't. Right. So I just want to make sure people know. You yeah, can, know. You can charge. Know. Know. Well, no, because I listened to 
the city council meeting where the prior mayor said that there was only so much he was allowed to charge. That's not true. You can charge, you can sell that property for any dollar amount right. you want. The overage just goes it's the, the overage. overage goes, we yeah. can't make we yeah. can't make a profit. Make the profit yeah. So right. all I'm doing is fine tuning the information and making sure that it's it's um, it's correct. Um, additionally, I had an opportunity to review the uh, attorney invoices. Uh, I think for the month of October, and I don't really care, and I it, I don't I'm on a need to know basis, so I'm just going to say I don't need to know. But I notice that council people call you and you bill them for the time that you talk to them on the phone. Um, I personally am not going to take advantage of that. Um, I'm going to be a little bit more transparent, I think, with my conversations and keep them on the record. So if I have anything to say to the city attorney, for the most part, I'm going to talk to you, you know, in an open meeting. And if I do speak with you, I would ask that you put my name down on the invoice because I don't want to go behind anybody on city council. I want my name to go down on that invoice and say exactly what I spoke to you about. So if anybody wants to know what I'm talking to you about, <coughs> they will know that. So that's just going to be my own personal policy. It doesn't mean anything about anybody else. That's, that's just me. Um, and last, I would just like to uh, say that um, we have a wonderful city. Uh, we have some great Christmas lights that are out there on Lake Street. The subdivisions are well decorated. Clearly, you have to stop by uh, Hidden Creek Subdivision, which uh, for, for almost over a decade is just an absolute uh, phenomenon for families to go and traverse through. Uh, they do a great job over there. I will disclose I live in that subdivision, um, but the people in there just work extremely hard to give just a fabulous light show for people in the community. And um, to everybody, I'd like to say happy belated Hanukkah and Merry Christmas to everybody. Thank you. I have a couple. Um, I noticed uh, today, I got notice from uh, the South Lion Fire Department that, Stat and I hope I say her name right, Stephanie Ship um, was given the 2015 South Lion Fire Department Firefighter of the Year Award. So I thought that should be uh, acknowledged because their, their volunteerism, their, <coughs> I couldn't run into a building, I couldn't do that. You know, I mean, and, and to get the award means she's going above and beyond what, what average is. So that also speaks great for our community to have people like that. So I wanted to acknowledge that for her. Um, the other one was I uh, had a meeting uh, earlier in the week with the mayor of Chelsea and the city manager in the morning and discussed to, just had general discussion about how they deal with some of their growing pains that they have in their town. One of the things that came up, which I was surprised, is that they have a very hard time attracting young population to their city unlike what we have, but their downtown is thriving and we're addressing that, you know. So some of the issues that they brought up in the meeting are definitely coming up on our plate with, with the master plan and, you know, and, our, and how we're handling the ordinances. We're, we're, we're in line. We're starting to acknowledge those things. It's a great meeting. They, they said any time we want to meet with them again, they would be glad to do it. Just had a couple cup of coffees with them and walked around the town a little, and uh, it was very, very good discussion with their uh, mayor and their city manager. And uh, they had spoke great about South Lyon. So we have a lot in common, and uh, I thought it was a really good reach out to me and thank Lynn for setting that up. Um, I was supposed to meet with Novi one. We couldn't quite get that together, but I ended up meeting him. On, um, we had the mayor's dinner for southeastern Oakland County. And I went out to Madison Heights, and I sat with the newly elected Northville mayor and the city manager from uh, Northville, and I uh, had a good discussion with the, met the uh, mayor of uh, Novi, and uh, very interested in sitting down and talking with us, like we talked about before, just having a discussion in a much larger city, but a lot of the same type of issues with traffic and roads and how they dealt with some of those and how did they attract some of their businesses and way out there, bigger than us, but um, same kind of what's their formula, you know. And we just had a really, really good dialogue, good conversation. And I wanted to tell Bob that the speaker for the meeting was the Oakland County Great Lakes Water Authority Director who made it very widely known quite a few times in his little presentation that he doesn't have a budget or I think you would like that. He has no budget, has nothing helping him at this point in time. That's going to change, hopefully. But they signed an agreement now to create the Great Lakes Authority uh, water 
um, authority, I guess, for better words. Mm -hmm. And they're all now going to get in tune. It sounds like Oakland County is going to have a big play in how the water situation is going on down in Detroit and what's going on. He talked about Flint going off the system, off the grid, back on the grid, and the problems they've had. And it was very, very informative on how important our water is here in South Lyon. It was very evident to me after sitting and listening to his discussion. And uh, We care very deeply. So... With that, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays to everybody, and uh, that's it. I move to adjourn. Second. Second. Happy Holidays. Third. Fourth. Bring your agendas up. We'll sign.